morning. Good morning, Professor Sheridan. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Uh, it could be better, but it could be worse. <laughs> that's 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 now what you'll say every day of your life. How are you doing? I think so. <clears throat> I'm having uh, lots of problems with my um, with some of my files, so I'll have to point out today some of the symbols, you know, because I usually work with. Uh, I usually work with Windows, Microsoft and Windows, you know, on a ordinary PC, but at home I'm working on a Macintosh. And so some of the files aren't compatible. It's not very bad, but it's very annoying. Yeah. So yeah. when there's an issue with the symbol, uh, I'll try and tell you. Okay. I'll try and make okay. it. But I'd love to fix it before I send out more lectures you know, the, the PDFs, because there's just errors. And some of the some of the effects are quite strange. So, but I've sent out now up to lecture eight, and I'm going to hopefully get to lecture nine today. Mm -hmm. And um, the problems only start in lecture nine, nine. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see how far we go. Yeah. The other thing is, I, I mentioned the last, I'll talk a little bit about surface relief gratings. Uh, yeah. I think it's and, but actually more interesting is the idea of inverse scatter because I've talked about the um, fitting the curves for the holograms and automatically fitting the curves for these polynomials. You can use different types of functions. So I might talk a little bit about um, how you can go about developing that sort of um, automatic searching for parameters. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it, I mean, either, you know, you can go, you can sit there and try and fit or you can uh, have some software do it for you. And I suppose the thing about software is it can get it completely wrong, or on the other hand, it can be quite unbiased. Okay, so in other words, it can look for solutions that you'd never think of looking for. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so let me put this down here. And what's this here? As I said, now you'll pardon me if it's a little bit rough and I promise I will I will get the uh, I will get the uh, these notes out to you as soon as I can as soon as I can okay so if I and share. if if there uh, could be some kind of mistakes please uh, I mean some kind of uh, mis yeah. mistakes between yeah. the Mac the and Windows yeah, yeah. just yeah. write to me and we will check it sure sure I will I will um I will uh, I will say it on the video anyways. Um, so the, the videos are coming. The people will have access to the videos, yeah? Because I know some of the students mentioned that they find it, because of the language, they find it very useful to have the videos, look at the videos soon after the, after the actual presentation. And so I know that I, I don't have, I haven't seen or I have no access to the YouTube from Saturday or from yesterday. So I, again, you know, um, I'm not being, I don't want to be a pain in the ass now, Vladimir, but you know yourself. Um, okay, so let me see if I can share this. I, I can hope you it. can. Yeah, I hope so too. So start share. See where we are. And again, again, if there's a, an issue with the YouTube from your end, you let me know because I have a facility to record here as well, you know? So I can uh, I can record on this end if that works better for you guys. Uh, actually, uh, as I know, uh, Christina sent old videos uh, uncut uh, to Maxim, and the only one issue with YouTube is that uh, on the YouTube we have the videos without uh, the last minutes with questions and answers, and as soon again as I know. Uh, it should be re-uploaded re to YouTube in, in some days. Okay. Well, that's fine. I mean, the nice thing with the Zoom as well is it, it has a capability to produce text. Yeah, it'll translate. So it'll, it'll, it'll give you a window where the words you've said. Now, it's not very accurate. Yeah. And um, the, 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 the presenter can edit it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which but but that to be honest with you, Vladimir, that takes quite a bit of time. I've tried to do it for my classes and editing 
so that they, it translates what you say, or, you know, and, and write, types it out, as well as the video, which would be very, probably very useful for you guys, but it's very, very intensive work, you know? Yeah. Uh, so for the Irish students, it's okay because they can hear me and, you know, um, we have some foreign students here, but mostly their English is quite good. Um, but if anybody has any problems with um, what I say or how I say it, just let me know and I'll, I'll try and uh, do, you know, do something about that. Okay. Just let me know. Okay. So can everybody see the screen? Can everybody see? I can at least. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, if, if the students have any questions, I mean, I'm very happy for you to ask the questions. But also, if you want, you can send it by chat to Vladimir, and then Vladimir can act as the moderator, okay? And again, please, if you yourself have any questions, uh, send me an email. So I've received emails from some students, and I've tried to reply as soon as I could, and as clearly as I could. The other thing is that if you have any problems getting access to a paper or a book I refer to, I know there was some problems with that link that I'd given there for Sims, um, and very kindly, it was made available from another source. I actually have a soft copy of that book. So if you can't get it, or Anne Kogan, if you can't get it, let me know and I'll ha very happily send on the references, okay? The most important thing is that you guys have access to the information. Again, I wanna emphasize that um, for the researchers, most of what I'm doing um, so far certainly is well established. And when I come to talk about polymerization and photopolymerization as well, I'm going to try, and I've been working on this, I'm going to mention stuff that's very recent, but most of the stuff I'm going to present will be stuff that's been done up to about uh, 2010, okay, 2015. Again, I, I like very much the idea of um, this material that I'm presenting to the class having been out there for some period of time. So if there's something obviously wrong, the community would have drawn our attention to that, okay? So it's reasonably accurate. Um, but please, if you see something you don't like, tell me. That's how you can um, very easily uh, improve research. Okay. So I hope that's okay now for everybody. Are there any questions? Okay. If not, then I'll just move and move forward. Again, I, I want to mention this again because this should be a big thing for you guys uh, the 60th anniversary of Dennis Zook's reflection gratings and next year, the, the 50th anniversary of Gabor. And I'm sure there's going to be things going on. And, and I, 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 I really encourage you guys to go out and source your own information. Um, that's part of being an engineer. And some of you can do this very well. Uh, you know, diff, people have different skills, but being, just going out and looking things up. And as I said, sometimes you'll find something uh, that will explain something to you better than anything I could ever do. OK, so now we talked about this the last day. I gave a little intro to some of the work we've done on speckle. I talked a little bit about the electromagnetic theory and specifically I went and talked about this second order modeling and how you could go away and you could solve that second order modeling using the state space method. And another method, of course, would be something like finite difference, finite time difference, finite element. Uh, basically, they all boil down to taking uh, the layer and breaking it down to some sort of grids, either two-dimensional grids or three-dimensional grids. And we talked a little bit about this and I went through the boundary conditions to try and emphasize the difference between what we've done before and what we're doing now and how you go away and actually solve that numerical problem where now you've got this S, this uh, X here now is made up of all these coefficients we saw on those sums and the Rs and the transmitted and the reflection coefficients here. And you can write it all down in the matrix and you can invert that matrix and find out the various values given the S values from the previous calculation. So we talked about that and I hope that made some sense to you guys. Um, uh, then I talked about the situation where we have a generalized uh, variation in a cross-sectional permittivity. And I mentioned that, for example, this permittivity here could actually not just be in a volume, but could be in some sort of a rectangular surface relief grating. Uh, so we could have very extreme fluctuations in the index modeled by this Fourier series. And of course, the, co the convergence of that would then become important. And any slants, for example, on the surface relief surface would become important. But again, the emphasis being that this all comes down, it all still uses this expansion, which uses the flow K uh, expansion. 
So I'm going through this. I went through this last time, going through this fairly quickly here because I expect everybody to understand what's going on. And then I simply gave you this formula here and I told you, look, go back if you want a little exercise just to see how these things work together. Where we had in lecture five, we talked about N waves and H gratings. And we looked at this coupling, direct coupling between all of the, between this S2i and the S2i plus and minus integer values with the appropriate coupling constants for each one of those grating components, the K1, the K2, the K3, etc. Where again, K2 now would be equal to two times K1, K3 would be three times K1. So we have this coupling. And then I started talking about this, uh, these holographic optical elements, and I wanted to give you some examples of their applications and what these applications look like as a sort of bit of motivation. And this was pretty much where I was the last day when we finished. And I talked about the holographic optical elements being seen very much as replacements for bulky refractive optical elements. And they have quite significant advantages in terms of their compactness, that they're thin, light uh, weight, and that can be used. You can coat materials with these polymer layers. And these layers in the past, people were using layers about 100 microns thick or even more. And now commercial products with very high modulations uh, can easily be made, which are 20, 30 microns. In the past, the materials were typically um, only sensitive to one wavelength, maybe two. And now you've got materials which are sensitive to multiple wavelengths, red, green, blue. And then the disadvantages, though in some cases, some applications that can be advantages, are the fact that because this is a grating, it's dispersive. You get diffraction orders, you put white light in, you get a rainbow out. And again, that can be very advantageous in some cases because associated with dispersivity is the ability to select our wavelengths um, or anisotropy because of the structure. You have different refractive index seen by the radiation depending on the orientation of the E field with respect to the grating. So these can be part of the application and very important functions which offer advantages over refractive optical elements or they can be uh, drawbacks. But again, every one of these drawbacks, there are potential ways to overcome them. And then the series of applications we mentioned, we've been talking about them in and out with beam splitters, polarization, sensitive devices. We talked about the coupling, the uh, grating, the, the growth curve of the diffraction efficiencies for overmodulation and how this affects the TE and the TM case of radiation, and that we could build polarization sensitive uh, beam splitters, uh, prisms, deflectors, simple deflectors, and this would come under a general title of beam shaping, uh, multiplexers and demultiplexers. So in the case of uh, uh, multiplexing or demultiplexing, we could have a beam incident with many wavelengths, and then each one of those wavelengths would come out on a different diffraction order and a different angle. And similarly, we can put in beams with different wavelengths and they'd all come out in the same direction. So we can imagine coupling into and out of devices, uh, spatial shuffling and compression, and I'll show you what that means. And this also involves, requires often knowledge about the polarization effects taking place in these gratings. Uh, in coupling and out coupling, drop add on gratings. And again, uh, lenses, you can have many, many lenses recorded in a single layer, it depends on the dynamic range of the material, where you can take the beam and you can focus that beam or different wavelengths can be made up of different wavelengths and focus the different wavelengths at different points in space. So again, this again permits multiplexing and demultiplexing. We could have an array of light sources with different wavelengths incident upon a holographic element, and then all of the light would come out in the same direction. Now, all of these things have practical limits, and the practical limits are enforced both by the theory that you use. So for example, if you use full rigorous theory, you won't get as high a diffraction efficiency as with Kogan, as Kogan will predict, and also practical effects. So the fact that we always deal with finite beams, the fact that there's always some surface boundary scatter or some roughness, some inhomogeneity in the material, which will lead to losses or absorption of the radiation. Okay. So here we have our beam shapers. So these, again, just to give you the examples of a volume hologram, a blazed grating, and a, a, a binary or lamellar approach. Uh, and all of these have their advantages and disadvantages. The last two primarily are surface relief, they're very robust. So a volume hologram is often made in a plastic, which just isn't as strong, as robust as maybe something etched into a surface. And um, binary, of course, has advantages in terms of simply a single etching process. However, you've got to be able to etch very fine structures. And uh, the blaze grating, all of these are essentially um, prisms 
Yeah, they're acting as prisms. So you put in some sort of a plane wave and the plane waves deflect it, okay? And again, this would be the basis of your Fresnel zone plates, uh, where a refractive element would simply have too big, would be too bulky. And I suppose the most extreme cases you see of these Fresnel zone plates would be in lighthouses, where they have these lenses that are, are very, very big and they're made up of echelets, which have different sizes or lengths. I'll give a little figure which just illustrates that. Um, but all of these are diffractive optical elements and they're all performing these beam shaping operations. And in all of these cases, the model you use to, to actually figure out what's going on, the rule is, as I preached before, is keep it as simple as possible. So if you can start with some sort of scalar model and using a transmittance function and Fourier transforms and build up some sort of a general idea of what the, of what the element is doing. And of course, if you're working in that regime, and propagation of that radiation to some plane is also easy because it will involve a Fresnel transform, which can be implemented using a Fourier transform. So knowledge of the fast Fourier transform and how to do sampling appropriately and zero pad, et cetera, uh, is very crucial for all these signal processing operations or optical systems. So if you can deal with the, the scattering by the object using that, then you might as well kill two birds with one stone. So in other words, you figure out how the object scatters using Fourier transform, and then you propagate the radiation using Fourier transform. And this again is something where you, you know, like uh, the fact that you can use the same tool to do a couple of things gives you several advantages. And then as you go forward, you move to a more rigorous model. So multiple waves, uh, angular, expansion, the Rayleigh expansion, and maybe even having to include these evanescent waves, these non-propagating waves. And again, I've been preaching this to you on the basis that you may have a layer, a holographic layer, which is sandwiched between, for example, air and glass. And there can be beams propagating in the glass, which are not propagating in the air. And so it may become necessary to retain more waves, some of which will be evanescent in your calculation in order to have an exact, or perhaps not exact, but a more accurate description of the field inside the volume. So this total internal reflection, some of the beams may be totally internally reflected at the air uh, polymer surface. And then the rigorous electromagnetic method, integral or differential, and we've talked primarily about differential methods, but we'll talk a little bit about these uh, finite time domain methods and things like that. Okay, so here we had just again this idea that we can use these models to deal with the surface relief grating, lamellar, V-grooved, or in section, and we can replace a prism here by a stepped structure like this. And again, in this case, we will be taking multiple layers, we'd have slices, we'd have expansions in each one of the slices here, we'd have each one would have a different fill factor within a particular period. And then of course, we have to make sure these are aligned. It's no point modeling it if we didn't have a phase shift between the various parts, and we'd have to match the fields between the various layers. And we can do this for non-uniform volume holographic gratings, as well as for the actual uh, surface relief gratings, but it's very clear you have to do it for the surface relief gratings. And again, we mentioned in relation to polarization, if we have something which is two-dimensional and we make it symmetric, then both the TE and the TM are going to see the same pattern. Okay, there's no asymmetry anymore. So you can basically make sure that the material is a effectively polarization and sensitive you can certainly reduce the polarization sensitivity. And this goes for the volume holograms as well. So for example, we could imagine crossed gratings where we'd have an interference pattern and then we'd rotate our plate by 100, by 90 degrees and record again. So we'd have two crossed gratings. And again, this would permit uh, producing deflections in two directions at the same time. But we have to be careful because, again, we're going to, in that case, have to be working with our evil sphere, not our evil circle. Okay, so some applications here. This is our head-up display, our off-axis mirror. Uh, so again, we could have a, a projection onto this mirror, and we could have somebody looking at that projection in this direction. And uh, we can have these multiplexing and demultiplexing. So again, we could have a beam coming in here and three beams coming out. So this could have three different wavelengths and each wavelength would come out in a different direction. Uh, and then similarly, we could have this beams at those wavelengths being fed in here. And then we'd have a resulting beam, which would come back out here. And the efficiency would depend on what we actually have recorded inside that layer. And then a nice application for people is, and the, the, the people, you know, we talk about the transmission and reflection elements and we talk about their selectivity characteristics. You may want to couple something into a waveguide. 
and have some flexibility on the angle you can put this in, uh, or indeed, uh, or you may have a source which has got some as um, angular spectrum, and we want to get high efficiency into all those angles. And on the other hand, we may have a very, very precise wavelength. Uh, and uh, so we can have this wavelength, we, we're not worried about the wavelength selectivity here. Okay. So we put this in and we would get only this beam for that wavelength on Bragg brought up here. So we can mix and match the elements depending on the function. But it is important to know that, that we would get, even though this is drawn in such in this way where it appears that both of them are basically achieving the same function, there are different advantages and disadvantages to using these two types of element with the waveguide. Okay. Uh, primarily, as I just mentioned, to do with the, the fact that the transmission grating is highly angular selective and the reflection grating is going to be highly wavelength selective. So we can get different types of functionality, depending on the application. Okay, so we go to the next slide. And again, this is our more general case that when we start recording things like lenses, we're going to have very, very complex uh, fringe patterns, interference patterns. Now, well, for optical engineers, of course, these are not particularly complicated looking patterns, but in terms of our mathematical description or model describing what's happening in this structure, we're going to have a mixture, a complicated mixture of fringe types. And we've talked previously about splitting, for, taking layers in depth, and then basically treating each individual layer as an individual hologram, and then stacking those. So having some sort of a matrix describing the input output characteristic of every layer and varying the parameters in that matrix we might call it, for example, a Kogelnik matrix, if we could model what's happening in an individual year using a Kogelnik. And this would relate, this would, uh, this would allow for having two inputs. If, you, if you've got two exposing beams, you could have two inputs and two outputs, and you could multiply these matrices to find out the total effect. Or in this case here, what might happen or what might be necessary is not just having laminar layers in this direction, but also having some uh, uh, um, slices across here, where we replace each individual part here by a sing by a hologram in each layer. And again, we can think of our refractive element, uh, a lens, and treating the lens as being a set of prisms or a Fresnel zone plate, where we have this uh, sawtooth type of arrangement, where in fact the size of the, the extent of the sawtooth varies as you move further out. You've got higher and higher spatial frequency information as you move out, so uh, smaller uh, prisms of finer extent or holograms of finer extent. And again, that type of approach always uh, uh, requires this idea of adiabatic variation, that you can uh, sensibly uh, come along and replace the diffractive optical element by a series of slices in the Z direction and also finite elements uh, up and down here that we can approximate it reasonably well. Yeah, it's a slow variation and therefore we can piecewise approximate it. And I think, as I mentioned to you, in most of these cases where we've got some sort of sampling, most of these finite time diff difference methods, that's what we're doing anyways. But that's effectively what we're, what's happening numerically. Okay. Uh, when this uh, was definitely we hadn't touched on the last day is the idea of beam splitters. So here we have a series of beam splitters. This one, we've got a beam coming in and we've got nothing transmitted and everything is diffracted pretty much into the plus and minus diffraction orders. And we see here we've got 0.499 and 0.495. And this is actually measured results. Um, again, here we've got a one to four. And all of these are reasonably close to 0.25. We see there's some variation and that all has to do with the control of the material and the control of the exposing process. And typically what you do is you'd make an element or you'd make an array of elements until you basically have fine tuned your exposing, exposing process. Any fluctuations are going to cause differences. And again, this can be achieved sequentially using sequential recordings, which was what was done here, or it can be done using some, some simultaneous type process. And here we now have retained this forward bun, and we've got now five beams, and we can see there's some variation here, but they're all they're all reasonably close to 0.2, which is uh, 50, uh, 20 percent. Okay, and here again would be the uh, readout angle as you vary your replay angle. You can see here this is a fairly stable. You can change the angle appreciably, and you still get this very nice beam splitting. Uh, here's just showing the actual uh, replay. Uh, diffraction efficiencies. And if we change our angle here of, of replay, we'll get some sort of an angular response where we'll be able to see ourselves moving on and off brag for these various patterns. Okay. This then is an application. I mentioned this idea of an achromatic behavior. Um, that if I replay a grating like this, and then I get two diffraction orders. So for example, I take this here and I produce two diffraction orders. And then I have 
two single holograms here, which are deflecting the light down to give me some sort of interference pattern. So this process here takes the single plane wave in and produces an interference pattern. And the question is, what happens if the wavelength changes here? So for example, I may want to use a light source which is poor quality, very cheap, uh, or I may have some temperature fluctuations over time. Now, if I use a simple refractive type arrangement, a beam splitter arrangement, what's going to happen when I interfere these two beams is that my interference fringes are going to change. If I change the wavelength, my interference fringes will change. Okay, simply by um, reflecting these things off mirrors and bringing the interference pattern together. If I change the wavelength, the interference pattern will change. And sometimes you want to have a very stable interference pattern. For example, this was actually developed for a device doing laser Doppler velocimetry. So you have particles moving through the fringes. And as the particles move through the fringe, they scatter light. And by monitoring the scattering of the light, you could figure out the velocity of the particles. So it's very important that the pattern here is very stable. What this does is, if I change my wavelength coming in here, and again, as I said, this is a reasonably stable type device. If I change my wavelength, and we know the transmission gratings are, are selective angularly, yeah, so this is plus and minus two, but the wavelength variation could be appreciable, and we still wouldn't see a huge change in efficiency. But what we will see is we will see changes in the angles at which these beams travel because of our grating equation. So on these second elements, we now have these beams hitting at, with different wavelengths at different angles. And if we go away and check, what will happen is we'll still be on brag here. So we'll still get the same amount of diffraction efficiency. And the beams coming out here now will have a different wavelength. Yeah. Uh, and they'll have a slightly different angle. Uh, and what will happen is if you build in, if you take account of all these effects, the net result is that my interference fringes will not change. We've actually made the device more stable. You know, we've made it achromatic, effectively. The changes in wavelengths don't affect the actual interference pattern because we have a combination of change of wavelength and angle. And so that gives you some an indication of the achromatic behavior and also the function of these holographic optical elements. And again, you could imagine a point source, yeah, incident on an element which produces plane waves, which are then produced collimated to give you two illumination, two parallel illuminating beams which again could find some use in these devices. And of course, these things can be stacked. Okay, uh, shuffling is another device system here where we have an array of holographic optical elements. Uh, and basically we have here a blue line which shows the straight through position. This blue line indicates a straight through position, but we have a situation where a beam coming into this element here will be deflected to this element up here. Okay, so we've, we've moved up and we've moved to the across in this direction. And then we have this efficiency coming out here. Now, what's interesting here is that if, for example, we have a linearly polarized beam coming in, then basically what we're doing is we're producing a diffraction, which is going to involve a mixture of TE and TM replay of that element. So for example, we could imagine this element here has been, if we had an ordinary grating and we replay in the plane of the grating, we're going to deflect upwards or downwards. So how do we get the flexion in this direction? Well, what we do is we record the grating if you want, and we could imagine rotating this entire plate, rotating this entire plate, so that this deflection is actually in the plane of the grating. So our fringes would be in this direction here. So we get a deflection in this direction. Now, what do we do? Well, we take our element, so we imagine rotating this recording, we rotate this back. And now what we're left with is we're left with deflection now, which is not in the uh, original plane of the grating. And so what happens is we now have E field components pointing both parallel to the fringes and perpendicular to the fringes effectively. So we have a mixed polarization replay of this element. And we're going to have a mixed polarization replay on this element because this is coming in at some angle. And now we want to bring it in here parallel to this Z axis. So we have to optimize the performance of these two devices, allowing for the fact that we've got polarization replay. So again, we can also tackle this to some extent by using circularly polarized input beams. So all this, although this seems like a simple type of deflection, when we come down to an analyzer elements, we've got to allow for this change in the polarization. And here's a device here where we've swapped columns, yeah? And we've also compressed them. We've brought them closer together between. And this here we see, this, these boxes here align exactly with these boxes. So what's happened here is we've moved this over here 
yeah, to the top right, and we've compressed them, and we've also switched the columns. So we can perform various types of shuffles or compression of spacing using these types of elements. But again, we have to be very conscious of the fact that we may have some effects taking place here, which are uh, have, have to include the fact that we haven't got simple T or T and polarization. We've got some mixture of the two, yeah. And again, if we're very careful here, we may also have improved some sort of, we may have improved the uh, chromatic behavior. And again, recall that the T and TM are diffracted with different efficiencies. So we're gonna to have to have some balance between the two, okay? The grating strength. And here's this butterfly type effect where we've got these beams coming in, we've got some light transmitters and we've got this deflection. And producing these arrays, automating the production of these arrays can be quite complicated. And then this here is our uh, coupling in and coupling out devices. And this was work that was people were very interested in. It's very much analogous to a lot of the things people are trying to do with augmented reality. But this was all this was previously done in the context of what were called backplanes or board to board interconnects. So what you had was you had a, 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 a board, and these boards typically were in cabinets connected by huge numbers of wires. And the idea was that we would have some optical performance, optical quality glass here, maybe even some built-in elements. And you simply insert the boards into some sort of a holder. And then optically, you would achieve some interconnection between individual boards. So you'd have transmitters and receivers at each board. And it was very simple. Again, this idea of the coupling up and down. It turns out, of course, to be much more complicated than this. But here, basically, all we've got here is we've got a series of a coupling in and coupling out elements. And again, can you use this with LEDs? Do you have to use lasers? What's the performance of the devices? And very many of the same types of problems, except even more dense arrays of elements or refractive or surface relief or holographic have to be used to produce these very, very fine uh, devices. Okay, so again, if you want some up to date information here, you can go and look at this roadmap paper. It's out there, you can see it. It's uh, an early publication, it's available as far as I know, it's freely available. And you can see there's contributions from a huge range of people all around the world. It's not complete in any way, but it'll give you access to a huge amount of other information and other people that are out there doing things. Now, we're going to talk first of all. Um, and I'm going to come back to this, but the experimental characteristics that we've talked about before, and I just want to remind you of where we're going and what we're trying to do. We're going to be doing experiments. So we've talked now about the models and we've talked about the applications. And now we need to get down to the nitty gritty of what actually happens when you record these things and how do you understand what happens in these materials. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, I'm going to concentrate very much on photopolymers because pretty much they're the most popular uh, type of material out there. And there are a whole range of photopolymers. So it's not just one type of photopolymer. And I hope I'm going to be able to talk about some different photopolymers. And those photopolymers are sensitized in different ways to light. So I'm going to talk a little bit about dyes. And they have advantages and disadvantages associated with them. So for example, there are materials which are have very high glass transition temperatures. So PQ, PMMA. And those types of materials, you can make solar concentrators with them. And they can be put in the desert and they'll operate. Whereas if you use some of the other materials, maybe possibly materials that you might consider using for holographic data storage, if you put those into the desert, they're basically going to melt, okay? The gratings would disappear because they have lower glass transition temperatures. And the glass transition temperature is basically the temperature at which the material starts to flow. And glass has a glass transition temperature. So we're going to talk a little bit about these types of materials, but again, it's very important to come back to what we're actually going to be measuring and how we're going to use what we measure to find out what's happening inside these gratings. So how does a diffraction efficiency vary with exposure? We've talked a little bit about growth curves, okay? Uh, what do measured growth curves look like? Uh, is overmodulation experimentally observed? Does shrinkage or swelling happen? And what is measured off Bragg? And how can we use what's measured off Bragg? So these are fairly obvious types of questions. And we've, I've already told you some of the ideas and I've showed you some of the curves so that you're kind of familiar with them. So as we go forward, I'm gonna be presenting them and talking about them. And because you're already familiar, hopefully it'll help you understand what I'm trying to say. So how does, and importantly, and this is one of the things that sort of um, certainly stimulated a lot of the work I, I went at, was how does diffraction efficiency change as the period, the spatial frequency of the exposing pattern changes, okay? And all of these boil down to one question. And that question is, what is the material response? 
how does the material response change? And ultimately the actual question about how can we control the material response? So it's one thing to say, well, we've got a particular material and we now we know how that material works. But as I said, there can be very, very different materials. So the question is, how can we exp uh, understand more than one material? And if the actual chemistry or the physics involved in what happens inside two materials is very, very different, how can we actually compare those materials? How can we go away and compare those materials? Now, I, maybe I could remind you something here. And um, most of you will be familiar with some ideas from optical signal processing and the idea of uh, the 4F, the 4S optical imaging system. So the idea that you can take any imaging system, and I suppose we should say in the paraxial regime, but we can express it as a Fourier transforming module, a spatial frequency filter, and then another Fourier transforming module. And two Fourier transforms in a row basically give you an inverted function, an inverted image. And the spatial frequency filter that you put into the system describes the point spread function of that type of mod of that type of imaging system. Now, the important point in why I'm mentioning this is because we can take almost any imaging system that we would use, telescopes and microscopes, and we can express them as this 4F imaging system. So it allows us to make a fairly decent attempt at comparing the performance of a lot of different types of systems. It doesn't explain everything. It ignores a huge range of effects. But if we have a simple model that allows us to compare things, then basically we have a, a good rule of thumb. Yeah, we can do some simple, we can apply some simple ideas and get a rough idea of how we can compare systems. So it would be nice to have a model which we could use to do that, okay? Because if you make very, very specific models for very specific materials, sometimes it's very hard to compare the performance of the different materials. You can go out and, of course, do a huge range of experiments. Yeah, but often the preparation of the material itself is quite complicated. And two groups that make the same material may get quite different results, not because one group is cheating, but simply because some materials are very, very sensitive. And let me just give you an example. And PQP MMA. I have been told by somebody I trust a great deal, a Professor Xu, who works in Taiwan, that the performance of the material actually depends on the shape of the layer. And so if you pour this material into a receptacle and the receptacle has different shapes or sizes, you can actually get different responses from the material, which sounds very strange and I don't understand it, but he's told me this is what happens and I would tend to believe him, okay? Okay, so we've seen these things before. So here we've got our, our our diffraction efficiency. So this would actually be the thing we'd measure. We'd measure the diffraction efficiency as a function of time using our experimental setup. We'd replay our grating. And as we formed the grating, we would see something like the maximum diffraction efficiency and it would decrease and it would come back up again. But we can see here that it isn't nice and linear. It's not a sinusoid. It's a sinusoid in which the amplitude and the period varies with time. And we can take this so we can expose and we get something like this. And what we can see sometimes is that if we replay, if we have a particular diffraction efficiency, we've got here 0.4. So we might, might have a grating here with this diffraction efficiency or on Bragg it could be here or it could be here. So there are three possibilities to achieve that diffraction efficiency, on Bragg diffraction efficiency of 0.4. But what we might see is that we would record the grating and then at some time later, and we do an angular scan and we see here that we've got this non-uniform effect that we talked a little bit about. So we have these side lobes are disturbed. And then we come back to this material maybe sometime later, maybe a couple of days later, it depends. And what we will see is that our angular response has changed. It's maybe a little bit lower, but it's actually shifted here to the, um, to the right. So we no longer replay on Bragg at the same off Bragg parameter. So the replay angle or wavelength have changed. The on Bragg replay wavelength have changed and they may change uh, during the recording, or they may change after the recording. So we can have this temporal variation. Now, if we have this, if we capture this diffraction efficiency or diffraction selectivity, I mentioned these two things that we've got different definitions of what we can calculate. We then can convert this into an refractive index modulation. Now, how do we go from the diffraction efficiency to the refractive index growth? Well, we have our Koenig expression, which relates diffraction efficiency on Bragg to the refractive index, the coupling constant and the grating strength. And so using this, and if we've got the diffraction efficiency, diffraction selectivity, and we've allowed for friend reflections, we can come along and we can get out something like this. 
Now we don't have to use Kogelnik. We could go away and we could use the rigorous coupled wave model, the, the Gaylord one, where we keep in the second derivatives. And if we would use that, we could maybe measure more than one diffraction efficiency. We could measure a couple and we could use that rigorous electromagnetic model to get a more accurate calculation for what the first harmonic of the grating is. And we could even go out and see if we could find out some information about the second harmonic, okay? Because we're probably going to have some nonlinear effects, excuse me. So again, this is all nice and ideal. Yeah, this is actually some experimental results because you can see the distortion. But again, in the real world, we don't get an N1, which looks like this, this nice curve. We usually get something which actually looks like this. So we start to expose, nothing happens. Yeah, we get no diffraction. And then we start to get some diffraction and we use Kogelnik to, con 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 um, excuse me, to convert that diffraction efficiency into a modulation. And when we do that, we end up with something that looks like this. And here's a comparison between experimental results and theoretical results. And in fact, in this case, we've actually stopped exposing at some point here. So we've stopped shining light on the material. And when we stop shining light, in this case, what happens is the actual diffraction efficiency will change after we've stopped exposing. So we put light in and nothing happens. And we talk about inhibition. Eventually something starts to happen and we get this growth. And then at some point up here, we stop exposing, but the grating keeps changing. There's still an evolution of the material with time. And if we stop the light, we still get having something happening over here. Okay, so we have what are called dark reactions or dark effects. So it's a bit complicated. And we need a model which will explain all of these things. Okay, and give us information about this N1. And hopefully we want something more than that. We want to take this N1 information, yeah, this modulation, this variation of the permittivity or refractive index terms, and we want to convert that into, we want to use that to extract information about what's happening chemically inside the layer. Okay, we want to use it to find out, for example, how the dye absorb absorbs light and then use that absorption of the light is turned into a change in index inside the material and that may involve for example in the polymer layers it involves polymerization or chain growth where you convert a monomer units of monomer into a chain which is called a polymer it may involve diffusion of that monomer so if we use up monomer in one place and we don't use it up in another place, we have a gradient of concentration and the monomer will move from the place where there's lots of monomer to the place where there isn't so much monomer. And so we can see that strange things are gonna happen here. And how can we extract all that information from a simple measurement of, for example, refractive index modulation, yeah? In fact, how can we go from a density of monomer or a density of polymer to a refractive index? So this is what I've spent a big chunk of my life trying to do with mixed success. So again, we have these diffraction efficiency, these on Bragg curves, diffraction efficiency growth curves. We have these off Bragg angular response, and this would be for a material which you can see here is very nice and linear. We have no chirp and almost no modulation. We can have a diffraction efficiency for overmodulation, And this was a result we actually produced by stacking multiple layers, okay? So you can see we've managed to go all the way up, pretty much all the way down, back up again. And we've managed to produce a, a model which actually fits that curve, yeah? Includes material effects. Now, you might notice here too, the time here is 80 seconds. So you can see this is a, a long exposure. Uh, you can decrease the duration of the exposure by making the material more sensitive, okay? By having more dye, so that when you put light in, you get every photon absorbed and every photon producing polymer or changing the refractive index in the material. But there are advantages and disadvantages to that as well, because if you use up monomer rapidly, you'll have large gradients of monomer in the material and you might not have enough time for monomer to diffuse from dark regions or darker regions into brighter regions to be converted into, monomer, into polymer. So we have to talk about all these effects. And 
I mentioned specifically this notion of a spatial frequency response. And I give here a result we did comparing a particular uh, uh, biomaterial science or covestro pre-commercial pre, pre material with the material that we work with. And I'm gonna talk, many of the results I'm gonna talk about are, are results I've done. Yeah, and mentions work by other people, but a lot of what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about what I've done because I can talk about that better. It's easier for me, but also it gives you the general idea of what I'm trying to do. But in this case, we compared the performance of this commercial or pre-commercial material with the performance of acrylamide uh, in polyvinyl alcohol. And what you can see is that the, as we change the number of lines per millimeter, okay? So you can take the number of lines per millimeter, you divide a millimeter by a thousand here, for example, and that's gonna be a period of a micron, essentially. So that corresponds to a period of a micron. And we've done some experiments where we've gone up to 5,000 lines per millimeter, okay? Not, I must say, with the acrylamide, but working with the uh, BMS type material. We've done reflection gratings, and reflection gratings tend to have finer structures than the trans corresponding transmission gratings. But what we see here is we've got an indication of the modulation, yeah, the modulation achievable. So we expose it, and we expose it with interference patterns where the period in the interference pattern gets finer and finer. Yeah. So up here we have big periods, down here we have very small periods. And what we see is that as we do the exposure, the, we have a, a low response for both of them at big periods, which we'll talk about. And then as we increase the, the spatial frequency, as we in, decrease the period, we see we have a maximum response for the PVA around 1,000, yeah, 1,500. So we have a region in here, so let's say 500 up here to about 2000, where the acrylamide PVA works well, gives you a particular uniform 0 0.002. So two by 10 to the minus uh, 10 is the modulation. And on the other hand, for the covestro material, we see that we have an increasing modulation. In fact, it goes up here to about one by 10 to the minus uh, uh, two here. This is, I said, a pre-commercial material now, yeah? So this is, sorry, two by 10 to the minus three. This is one by 10 to the minus one, all the way up here to very high spatial frequencies, to very small periods, whereas the acrylamide falls off. So in this case, you've got a band pass filter associated with the material. If I try to record particular gratings with particular spatial frequencies, if I have a mix of gratings that lie in this range, I'm going to get pretty much a uniform response. If I have twice the intensity over here, I'm going to get twice the, twice the strength of modulation that I get over here, okay? Because I've got a relatively flat spatial frequency response. But if I go to low periods or high periods, what I'm going to see is that I'm not going to get a linear response. I'm going to get a lower recording modulation. For the same amount of light going in, as I change the period, I get different modulations. And this is quite important. We also see here that the acrylamide seems to be quite much worse than the actual uh, covestro. So a question is, can we make the acrylamide better? And we've looked at ways to do that. And then of course, there's the question that why would anybody use a bad material? Well, uh, first of all, we're used to this material and we want to come, we're working with our models to try and make the models better. And so if we use the same material developed and manufactured in exactly the same way, we can do one-on-one -on -one comparisons over a long period of time. Secondly, nobody owns the acrylamide material. It was first proposed for use by a man called Calixto, Calixto in Mexico, uh, going back again about 30, maybe 40 years. Uh, it was then proposed to put different dyes to sensitize to different wavelengths. And so there's a huge body of work out there of people who are working with this material. It's cheap. Uh, it contains acrylamide, which is not the nicest chemical to work with, but it only involves using this chemical in very small doses, and you've got to do it in, in, in cabinets, fume cabinets, etc., to be very, very careful. But at the end of the day, it's very easy to use. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you might make this layer and maybe compare it to the industrial preparation of these layers. So the next thing here, the next logical step now is to start talking about these materials, and I'm going to do that. So the next set of slides I've got. And uh, this here is uh, eight. This is the slides associated with eight. I'm going to go and I'm in nine, I come along and I start talking about these materials in more detail and the models of these materials. But I mentioned yesterday that since we talked about the rigorous electromagnetic, second order rigorous electromagnetic model, it might be nice, for example, to go and look for a minute at surface relief gratings. Because if you talk to people in the industry now, there's essentially two technologies that are competing for use in these virtual 
headsets. So one is these holographic optical elements where you expose a layer with some light and you make a grating inside. And the other are surface relief gratings where you use some process to manufacture a pattern onto a surface. And then you use that to couple light in or couple light out or to uh, produce lensing type actions, okay? And this ties in with the notion of beam shaping, uh, diffractive optical elements, spatial light modulators, optical modeling and electromagnetic modeling. Okay, and also the propagation of light through free space or through optical systems. So in general, you want to be talking not just about paraxial beams, but beams traveling at a range of different angles. So you've got, again, you might start off with a simple model, but then you've got to go to a more complicated model. Okay, so again, I want to emphasize that these surface relief gratings, you can have 10 gratings. So we talked about binary phase lossless elements, daemon or pyramid type structures or effective medium theory. So these lamellar structures where the period is finer than the wavelength. And so the light basically averages over the actual uh, surface relief structure. It doesn't see it. So we could imagine taking a surface and making a very fine pattern on that surface. And then that very fine pattern would have a different refractive index to the substrate. So you'd have air material, air material, but because the structure is so fine compared to the wavelength, the wavelength effectively averages over it. And so we see a layer and we can produce layers like that for anti-reflection coatings as anti-reflection coatings. Most anti-reflection coatings are simply plastic layers with a finite, with a particular refractive index and a particular depth so that you get most of the light and it can be broadband. So you get maybe instead of having for normal instance, something like 4% reflected, you may have only 1% reflected over a wide band of visible wavelengths. But you can generalize this by making these surface relief patterns and you can actually even achieve very low uh, reflection over very broad bands. But then you've moved into these thick or resonance type situation. And I've got a couple of examples. I can show you what these are like. And also maybe it might make clear again, this notion of polarization effects and the conical mount and binary anti-reflection coding beam splitting. So again, this is exactly the same type of modeling. It's got the same set of physical uh, parameters associated with it in terms of its performance, but the manufacturing process, there's many different manufacturing process, but certainly compared to volume holographs, the manufacturing process is very, very different. And the results can be very tightly controlled if you've got a high precision fabrication process. The difficulty being that this sort of high precision fabrication process tends to be capital intensive. You've got to buy equipment. So like electron beam etching equipment and things like this, which are very expensive to buy, install and to run and to maintain. Okay, but again, this is the competing technology. The other thing I thought would be useful here is to emphasize this notion of inverse scatter and diffractive optical design, because we talked before about the idea of having non-uniform gratings and describing the coupling constant, yeah, a variation with depth in terms of polynomial. And that polynomial would have a certain number of coefficients. And the idea would be that we would fit the experimental result with the actual predictions of our theory. And we would vary the coefficients until we found a good quality fit. And I mentioned that there were many different things that could vary. You could have a variation in the modulation of the grating. So you have a polynomial associated with that. And you could have also a variation in the chirp the variation of the period with depth, and, and this could be also associated with a variation in the refractive index. So the point could be that we would be performing a search, and that search might involve many parameters, and if you've ever been involved in something like that, it, it's quite tedious. Especially if, for example, you're trying to find out how something like a change in chemistry affects the uniformity of the grating, or a change in the exposing intensity. You can end up with quite a lot of data, and of course, as you work through the data, you become more and more intuitive. You recognize certain patterns, which can reduce the amount of time it takes to produce fits. On the other hand, what tends to happen is the, the people doing the fits develop a bias. So in other words, they expect certain types of polynomials to produce fits, and then they always start from those types of polynomials. And the result can be that you always get the same type of answer, even though in some cases there's an ambiguity and there may be possibilities of other types of answers. So that's an inverse scatter problem. You measure the diffraction efficiency and you want to find out what's inside the volume. The other is the design problem, where for example, I know my input light, I know what I want to get, I know my, the output pattern I want to get, and then I have some manufacturing process so I can make certain types of surface profile, and I want to find out the profile which will produce 
the intensity pattern I want or the diffraction efficiency I want, or perhaps the diffraction efficiency for different polarizations that I want. Okay. So this here is a, is, a, is, a, is a general, and you find this again over and over again, this link between the design and the inverse scatter. So what we've been looking at pretty much so far with Koganik is a scatter problem. Yeah, we have a particular structure, we put in a particular type of radiation, and we want to know what's coming out. But in the real world, often we're trying to design or we're trying to do inverse scatter. A microscope is essentially an inverse scatter piece of kit. We look at an image of something, and then from that image, we try to interpret and understand what that object is, whether it's a cell or a semiconductor chip. Okay. And because we've got these things called brains and they're quite clever things, we can certainly interpret what we see. But we have to be careful. Because, for example, most of us are familiar with the idea of a mirage, where people see things in the desert and they're not really there. Okay? Or some of these optical illusions you can get on the web, where there are patterns and you see movement in the patterns, but it's not there. You're, bas you're, you're, you're basically using the functionality of the brain against it to trick it into seeing things that aren't there. So we've got to be a bit careful. Anyways. Typically what this involves is some initial guess. So in case of fitting the angular curve, we, ch we choose some values of these coefficients, these polymers. We then go away and we do some scatter. We'd apply a scatter model and find some rigorous calculation. And then we'd have some cost function. So for example, we would compare the predictions of the model to the actual measured data. So we might do something like a, a least squares fit. So we subtract every theoretical prediction from every point for an angular scan or, or a growth curve. And then basically we try and minimize the difference between the predicted curves and the actual measured curves. And then we generate some new physical parameters, some new coefficients. And how we go about that is a problem all by itself. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then we come back and we use these new parameters to go back to our model and do another calculation. And we keep going and we have some process where hopefully we're going to iterate into the correct set of coefficients, or we're going to iterate into a surface pattern which produces the output pattern we want. Now, how we do this, there's a set of steps and there's a set of advice I can give about this. And again, the thing I'd say to you, you can buy packages which do this, but I'm always highly suspicious of packages. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I know the packages are getting better and better all the time, but one of two things tends to happen. Either the package is a wonderful package, but it will not do what you want to do because what you want to do is new and different. And the packages always usually do things that people know how to do. Or you try and use the package to do something that it's not meant to do, and then the package makes false predictions. So it's always a very good idea to have some physical intuition just to check reality check any software and in design due to software. So we have initial guest, we have test object, we have some rigorous electromagnetic or a scalar diffraction. And of course, if we can use a scalar model here for the scatter instead of a rigorous electromagnetic model, that will be good because it will make the whole thing much faster. Okay, so if we can find some scalar model that works approximately, gives us some intuition, we go for that. And then we've got some iterative optimization or search algorithm. And that basically boils down to how we actually find new or better parameter values so we continue with our search. And I'm going to talk about a couple of these very quickly. Uh, and then you're going to manufacture or measure or repeat. Okay, so you change your experimental results, you look at it from a different side. Uh, and of course, you can, the, 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 by limiting how you search, using the actual physical attributes of what you've got. So if you know the average index is uniform. If you know something, you can reduce the things you have to search for. So if you've got three coefficients or six coefficients, and if you can reduce those down to four by some clever little trick or by using a priori knowledge, things you, already, you know about the system, then you can basically speed up your process. You've got less space to actually do the search in. So in the case of, for example, producing these lamellar patterns on the surface, you might, for example, have the refractive in the depth of a, of a of structure. You might have the fill factor, individual fill factor. You may have the angle of incidence or the polarization. Yeah. So you can vary the angle. You can vary the period and you can vary the, and you can see, well, well, what angle gives me the very, very best result? Or you can constrain it by saying, I know what angle I have to have. Okay. And then you don't have to search as big a space to find out what the best possibility is. So advice, initial values are very, very important. So for example, if you've already been fitting and you've got some basic sets of ideas, you can always use the previous result 
the previous best estimate as your starting point. Or if you know what the curves look like, you can look at them and say, well, I think this looks like this. Now, again, one of the issues there is that if you're using this a priori knowledge, this really good guess, it's almost certainly going to give you back something which is like the guess. Okay, so the first values are very important, but it's always good sometimes to try random values and see where you go, okay? You find, want to find a solution that converges to some local minima in your cost function. Talk about this. Find the best solution, a global minimum or maximum extremum. So in other words, you may have several possible solutions that give you low values on the cost function. So we can imagine that we want our cost function to be to reach some maximum value for a best fit or a minimum value for a best fit. But there may be multiple sets of parameters which produce a similar type of fit. So for example, we said about average refractive index variation and chirp. We could in fact say we've got no average index and we could get a best fit. And then we could say, well, we have lots of uh, average index variation and we get another best fit. And the two might be comparable and they'd both be considered local minima. There's an ambiguity. Two sets of coefficients give us the same answer. And we want something that converges reasonably rapidly. So again, how do you do this? Well, use intuition, experimental results, approximate models, existing designs, any insight to get a good starting value. And this is because the worse the starting value, the further away we are from the solution, uh, the design, the, the longer it's going to take. The physical model, again, and I, you know, I know it sounds like a record player here, but use the simplest model approach. And in fact, when we're dealing with these holograms and analyzing the material characteristics of the holograms, we're generally going to start off with Kogamik's first order two wave. And that's because it's relatively fast. We understand it fairly well. And if we want to use the rigorous model, we then take the inputs from this Kogamik model and we'd actually use it to, uh, to go for it. Sorry, yes, somebody wants to ask a question? Does somebody want to ask a question? Yeah, I believe Vasily wants to ask a question. Hey, Vasily. Yeah, hello. Uh, I, I wanted to ask one thing. Uh, well, actually, I have already a lot of questions, but I better preserve them to till the uh, okay. questions I, section. Okay, then please stop me from talking at a quarter to the hour, and then we'll have a 15 minutes or we can talk afterwards so we have longer time for questions. But if you have any questions as I go through, if something's baffling you, please just stop me, yeah? Okay, yeah, right now this is this is something that really yeah. like uh, the thing is that you, you just mentioned that for this approach uh, it is important to have a good initial guess yes and this is not only important like just because it will converge faster but also it may converge to another uh, local minima yes well isn't this actually in general like conceptually yeah an indication of a slightly faulty approach if depending on initial guess you will get different results exactly and so people have divided and i'm going to present them have, have presented a whole set of different ways to search for these parameters okay so I, i'll give you an example which is a gradient method and i'll show you what the gradient method does you've got a thing called simulator kneeling yeah which offers an opportunity not to get caught in a local minimum and then you've got quite a more exotic things, which are statistical or evolutionary, where basically you can have a much more thorough search of the space. And something I'm going to emphasize to you is that the, you, we talk about a local minimum and a global minimum. Uh, the global minimum may get you the best fit to the data, okay? And that may be our primary desire in terms of fitting the curves, okay? But in terms of desi designing elements, you're designing surface relief elements, local minima may in fact be better, okay? And what I mean by that is we may give a set of criterion to achieve a, a fit, okay? So we may say we want to have a maximum diffraction efficiency, and we may find a global minimum which produces the highest diffraction efficiency. But we may find out that that design is incredibly sensitive to the angle of replay or the wavelength of replay. Whereas we can take a local minimum, which maybe we have a lower diffraction efficiency for, but may be much better in terms of stability. We may be able to vary the input wavelength or polarization or angle and still achieve a sort of a stable diffraction efficiency. Yeah? Oh, okay, so, so the global minimum is not necessarily the best solution. It may not be the best. So yeah. again, this is, okay. this is one of these hard won lessons, okay? Um, we all know as engineers that often you have a situation where something is, has a problem, yeah? It doesn't work well in some sense. 
And if you're a clever engineer, the first thing you're going to ask yourself is, well, does that disadvantage provide me with an advantage? <laughs> yeah. So can I turn the bad thing into a good thing? Yeah. So that you have to test individual results. Yeah. Just because it's a global minimum doesn't actually mean it's the best. It is the best under the constraints or the requirements you've placed on it. But the computer program doesn't see beyond that. So it's your job to take the results and then actually check out what that means, okay? Another example is that you may, for example, have a global minimum, which is, let's say, 95% efficient, and a local minimum that's 94 or 93% efficient. But if your background noise, if the scatter due to the fact that you've got an imperfect beam or a noisy beam replaying, or you've got some uh, other types of scatter in the system, yeah, means that any experimental measurement you do is actually plus or minus two or three percent anyways, yeah? then there's really no practical significant difference between the 95% and the 94% of the 93%. And it may turn out that the 93% is much easier to manufacture. Yeah? Is that okay? I see, thank you very much, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna talk about this. I'll, I'll flesh this out a little bit, and I know this is a little bit off the core course material here, but I think this is something that every engineer should know because it comes up over and over in so many different situations. And if you're an optical engineer, as I said, it comes up both in terms of inverse scatter and in terms of design. And for us, it determines in some way how we actually process the data that we measure. Yeah? Are we okay? So we try and use the simplest model because it's gonna speed things up. And if we've got a solution using the simplest model, we can then use the outputs from that as an input to a more computationally intensive, more rigorous model. Uh, is, it, is the physical model sufficient? So we already talked about this in relation to, for example, the N-wave approximation, uh, that we could look at how far off Bragg the various diffraction orders were. And if a beam is very, very far off Bragg, we neglect it. We will not include it in our calculations. So this applies to a situation where, for example, we're using an n is equal to 4 model, and we come along and say, well, we actually only need n is equal to 3. OK? So we take Koganlik, and we expand Koganlik. We keep first order, but we have n waves. It's more computationally intensive. There may not be an analytic expression, but we may need it in order to get an accurate result. If not, then use these crude results to initiate a more rigorous search, okay? Physical model again, as simple as possible, transmittance if possible, multiple waves if possible, or rigorous if necessary, only if necessary, okay? The cost function. So how we actually compare our experimental results, our measurements to the actual predictions of the theory. You have to be careful about this, how you actually go about this. We want to use the simplest cost function possible, okay? So I talked there about a least squares fish, where we take all of the experimental data, for example, all the measured diffraction efficiency for a range of times or for a range of replay angles, and we do a least squares fit to that. But of course, if we've got 100 points, that's a lot of comparisons. One question is, could we get away with using two points or three points or four points? If we know what the maximum diffraction efficiency is, can we use that, for example, to calculate out an effective modulation or an average modulation so that, for example, we don't have to fit the on bright value. It's already built into our search. Yeah. So we try and use the simplest cost function possible. If we're doing a search, yeah. So, for example, I talked about using maybe three coefficients for the grating coupling and three coefficients for the polynomial for the grating. Can we get away with just assuming a linear chirp, yeah, or a linear modulation, or simply a, a exponential, a tapered modulation of the, of the actual modulation, in the, which case we only have one variable. Instead of a polynomial, we have e to the power of minus alpha times z, which we talked about. So that reduces the number of parameters we have to search for. And the fewer the parameters we vary, the fewer, the, the lower the dimensionality of the search. Make sure the cost function is getting you where you want to go, okay? That it's not ambiguous, okay? And what I mean by this is, it's, there, as I said, besides the local minimum, global minimum, we can sometimes apply constraints to problems, okay? Which basically are misleading. And the example I give to people is the square root of a number. We know that mathematically, the square root of a number can have a positive value or a negative value. 
And if we've got a program doing some sort of a search and it keeps hopping to negative parameter values, well, we want to avoid that. So one of the things we can do is we can constrain the search. We always have to have physical values. We can also constrain the search if we've got some manufacturing process with a minimum edge size that it only looks for things in steps which are equal to that edge size. There's no use trying to dry, design something uh, which requires an edge size 10 times smaller than what you can physically do, okay? If you maintain, you might, for example, want to do an academic study where you say, what's the best possible? But if you're actually manufacturing, it's probably a good idea to stick to what you can do, yeah? You can then later go and refine it if you've got nothing else for doing. Examine the cost function behavior. So cost functions that have fewer local minimum and or a single clear global minimum are advisable if possible. Now, this is, this is a black art because it's not always possible to explore the cost function. But sometimes what you can do is you can make up a function, yeah? And what you can do is you can check that all the different parts of your program are working. Yeah? So at least you know that, for example, you're not going to easily get stuck in local minima. You can also go away and you can actually do the scatter problem, as I mentioned. And from the scatter problem, you can look and see what the characteristic variations as functions of these parameters are and look for any strange things that can happen. So for example, in terms of gratings, if you're close to a cutoff, yeah, if you're close to a situation where one of the diffraction orders is going to be cut off, is going to be totally internally reflected, you can get sharp changes in diffraction efficiencies at those positions. So it can be advisable to avoid cutoffs. You're not going to manufacture something close to a cutoff in general anyways, because cutoffs, so we're talking about a situation where we play at a certain angle and then we increase the angle and then one of the diffraction orders, reflection or transmission, suddenly becomes totally internally reflected. It no longer propagates and possibly another diffraction order. So maybe the minus three disappears and the plus three appears, okay? And that requires a particular relationship between angle of replay and the period and the wavelength, okay? Now, Often we don't want to manufacture gratings or use gratings which operate close to cutoff because any fluctuation in, a, in the light source for wavelength will lead to cutoff. And as an hour, any roughness on the surface can lead to cutoff or can lead to a situation where a diffraction order is kind of popping out and popping back in again, which can disrupt the phase and can disrupt the intensity in the various diffraction orders. So we generally always try to avoid that. And we want to make sure, for example, that, and so we build that into our search, we make sure our cost function isn't affected strongly by that. And again, sometimes these effects are within the noise of the system, yeah? So if you've got some loss due to some roughness or some scatter or something, or imperfections in your measurement, then you've got to build that into your system as well. There's no use trying to calculate something to 10 to the hours, to, to say, I want a period, and you want the period defined down to a thousandth of a nanometer. Okay, because nobody in the right mind is going to be to manufacture that and any roughness characteristics you've got is going to be far worse than that, the effects of that optically. Some local minima may have useful or desirable properties. I've already talked about this. So this is a very type of simple illustration. We've got here a search space. We've got three parameters. So these could be the three coefficients that we use for fishing. Or if we're designing a diffractive grating, it might, for example, be a period of fill factor or a height or it could be the coefficients for the period, the grating vector, or for the coupling constant. So we design some physical parameters that are available that we can play with. We may not be able to vary, for example, the refractive index of the substrate material we're going to etch into. Uh, or we may. We may be able to vary the replay wavelength or the replay polarization, in which case we can build that into this. And for example, one of these axes could be the fraction or the cosine angle associated with the amount of T or TM. So we could go, for example, from linear polarization TE to linear polarization TM and everything in between. And we have some manufacturing process which may, for example, define some minimum depth. In terms of the holograms, there might be, we looked at the spatial frequency response, there may be a minimum period and a maximum period that we can record. And we can build that in. And that minimum maximum period could be associated, for example, with losses due to friendly reflections or to our, app, our app fabrication process that we simply can't get beams on our table above a certain size or angle. And any way we can reduce it, put in some uh, boundaries, is better. And then how we actually deal with this is that, for example, if we've got a search pattern and the search pattern is repeatedly telling us to go outside the ranges that we've placed on it, we can have some process whereby if the model predicts we should go somewhere that we automatically throw 
throw our guess back into the middle of where we're doing our search. So this will also help us, for example, miss maybe global minima or maxima. So the next thing is when should you stop your iterations? Uh, when the co one thing is when the cost function no longer changes appreciably. And we notice that for different sets of parameters, we may get the same cost function, okay? So we may have a different period fill factor or depth. And for two different sets of three, yeah, we may actually get a cost function value, which is very similar. But we can look at converging to within a clearly predefined limit. And acceptable accuracy may be defined by the physical system noise due to random scatter. So in terms of holography, um, one thing you can do is you can take your hologram and you can replay your holographic grating on Bragg. And then what you do is you take a, a detector. And what I've often done in the past, I've taken a piece of string, a piece of rope, yeah? And I've tied the stand with the detector to the stand holding the hologram. And then I've moved the detector around in a semicircle in the transmission direction, assuming a transmission hologram. And I've measured the light in all various angles. So we expect the light to come off in a particular direction and we're far enough from it that we can look at the scattered light. So you can get a baseline on the light being scattered by the hologram, which is not being sent in the direction of the fraction B. You can get a background noise feeling and you can do it in the reflection direction as well. And we're not just talking about friend reflections or multiple friend reflections inside the layer. We're talking about all the diffracted light that comes off at all the various angles, possibly because you've got a finite beam, you've got a finite grating or any other types of effects. So you can get this, you can do this sort of calibration that gives you a good solid idea of, well, that diffraction efficiency is actually plus and minus something. Where is the light that, that isn't in the diffraction efficiency going for a particular element? When the variable predicted no longer changes, so this is the other one, you can compare the parameter values. So not the cost function value, but the parameter values and see if the parameter values have come to a particular uh, a triplet, for example, of values and iterating more doesn't change that. If a minimum is found, then restart the process. The simplest thing is that if you come to some minimum, yeah, you restart the process, or if the thing doesn't converge, you go back and you give it a new starting value. That's the crudest way you can do it. And even with more complicated algorithms, it's always a good idea to try with very, very different initial points, your search, because it gives you a sense of how robust the process is. If every time you pick something different, you get a different result, you know you've got a lot of minima and you know you're getting trapped in a lot of the local minima. But again, knowing those local minima is something that's valuable. You shouldn't see it as a waste of time. Local minima may have different advantages or disadvantages with respect to one another, okay? In terms of the inverse scatter, it also gives you a feeling of how certain you can be about the various results. Now, I'm gonna talk about some of these different search algorithms. I'm gonna talk about the gradient method, simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, and simulated evolution. Now, anything I can say here is going to be fairly shallow. You can go away and look these things up on the web. You can find books that deal exclusively with these. And pretty much all of these have been expanded out in a huge range of directions. I'm gonna give you some indication of things that have been done in relation to simulated evolution and genetic algorithms. They sound kind of really sexy, but they're actually quite simple. It's very nice uh, that you can understand these things and it's a terminology, but you've got to understand these things have blossomed. You've got hundreds of thousands of computer engineers fiddling around with these algorithms because an awful lot of these things are tuned to particular problems. And often they have like literally got these twiddle factors inside to improve your uh, uh, convergence. Okay, there's in first, most of them, there's also actually detailed mathematical proofs uh, regarding when they converge and how they converge. Um, but some of them are they're still open problems, okay? So the last thing here is just, uh, I mentioned this idea of testing. So you can come up with various types of cost functions like the one shown here, which have got loads of local minima and loads of local maxima. And you could, this is modulated by a taper. You could modulate by a Gaussian. So you have a clear global minimum, but it's embedded amongst a lot of local minima. And you can just get a feeling for how your algorithm searches for and finds the local and global minima. And it's really worth your while to do little tests like this. So test them all on the same thing eh, under the same conditions and with something that's very simple to compute, a one dimensional search. And it'll just give you a feeling of the time taken and how the various algorithms work. And of course it gets more complicated, it's got to higher dimensional searches, but this is something that you can do. It's reproducible. It's always good to have something which is re reproducible, okay? Uh, and it'll give you a general characteristic for your search algorithms. Um, Run a test with any search algorithm you implement 
So specifically these research algorithms we talked, so apply these, for example, to find the global minimum of a function like this, or maybe as I said, a Gaussian multiplied by a high frequency sinusoid, where you have a clear global minimum and see what happens. Okay, and it'll give you a feel for how this actual search algorithm is working. So we have now our rigorous electromagnetic model, we have our starting point, we've got our cost function, uh, and we're, we're trying to get a feeling for how this search algorithm works. Again, okay. Now this is the simplest one, and you all know this. This is your gradient method. Uh, it's associated with things like newton raphson okay? And what I've tried to show here is a, a very simple case where we have a very clear minimum, okay? And we choose two different starting points, okay? And if we choose the starting point here, then with very few steps, in fact, it could be in fact only one step, we will get from here right down this line, it will follow this line right down here to the global minimum. So this is a situation where the judicious choice of starting value will greatly, greatly simplify finding the global minimum. There's also the point here though that I've drawn this here so that this is, uh, can be described as mono monotonically decreasing. We have a single global minimum and we've placed this first uh, choice here inside this steady uh, decay. We might even think of it being quadratic type decay. If however, we choose a different uh, guess, okay? And this is not a very, very bad algorithm in this case. What's going to happen here is we're going to take multiple paths, multiple steps of oscillating as it turns out around this blue line to get to the actual, but we will get to the global minimum. It'll just numerically take us a lot more steps. And if we're very unlucky and we don't have such a very nice uh, cost function behavior, then we may not get to that point at all. So in, in this particular cost function, we have a situation where a very bad guess is going to lead to a lot of steps. So it's going to be slow, but we will get there. But this gradient method suffers from the fact that if we have a more complicated cost function and we start off anywhere close to a local minimum, we're pretty much always going to get the local minimum. Yeah. So it follows the path of maximum gradient. It's fast. So even though I've got multiple steps here, even in that case, we still get the answer out very quickly. It converges given a good start value but it will get stuck in a local minima. So a bad starting value or lots of local minima, your chance of actually hitting the one you want is not great. However, if you do locate a whole load, if you do just randomly generate start points and you do locate a family of minima, you'll probably have one which is the best one in terms of your constraint and you'll have a load of other ones which you can explore the significance of. Now, simulation kneeling in a way is an extension of that gradient method. And you can think of it as follows. You essentially apply the gradient type method, right? But every so often, you're gonna predict a result which is worse than the previous result. So in the gradient method here, if you go back up here, every time, every time you get a step, if we've got convergence, we're basically getting closer to the right answer. So every step, if you want, is in the right direction for this case. The simulation kneeling works in the following way, that every step that you take doesn't necessarily involve going in the best direction. So here we have an example of a cost function and the cost function has a local minimum here and a local minimum over here and there's a global minimum, okay? And what happens is we have a method where we will have a particular ith result here for a particular parameter, we'll get a particular value of the cost function. And we can then generate, we have a possibility of generating the next result, okay? But we have a finite probability that we won't always choose to go in the direction of the minimum. We will have a certain probability that we will actually choose our next point to be worse than the previous point. And this sounds like a recipe for, for chaos here, uh, but it works. And it works in the, in the following way, that instead of getting trapped in the local minima, you have a finite probability of jumping out of that local minima and finding another minimum value. And you can keep track of where you were. You can sort of back up. If you go to a worse solution, you can back up the better solution for future use. Yeah, you could even take that and put that this one here into the gradient method and you definitely hit this here. But you have this chance that you will jump out of this local minima and jump over here. And now if we apply the gradient, we're gonna come back down here and we're gonna hit the global minimum. And the way the search works is that the probability of me, as you go forward with this search, yeah, the probability that you'll make a big enough jump 
to leave the local minima decreases with time. So we imagine this as sort of a like Brownian motion where the, the possibility is that the thing can move in any direction. And we lower the temperature. And by lowering the temperature, we decrease the probability that we're going to jump a certain distance away from the current solution. So we iterate through this and we basically have this chance to get to low, a global minimum. Now, again, this still doesn't necessarily always work because it depends on these twiddle factors. Like, for example, you've still got to pick a starting point and you've got to define the way in which your temperature decreases. OK. And again, people basically achieve this by going away and applying it to particular situations. And they've also made this fancier. So they may have every so often, they may reduce the temperature, but every so often throw in a big jump just to see what happens. Or they may iterate through a load of different starting points and try to span the space. So start out in different places in the state. But the chief result here is that although the convergence is not as quick as the gradient method, you have built in, yeah, so it's not generally as fast as gradient method, you've built in the possibility to get out of local minima and therefore not just to get stuck in the local minima. Okay, now again, there's lots of different ways to actually do this. Typically involves some generation of a probability and the application of the probability as to what solution you take or how you generate the next choice. And then that probability will decrease as you go through more and more iterations. So that's your simulation annealing. Genetic algorithms and simulated evolution came for, come from the same type of a family. Okay, and what they do, what they involve is generating a, not just one initial start starting value, but you generate a set of starting values, okay? And typically what this set is quite a large number, it's a population. So you come along and you would randomly, you might put in one or two values based on intuition, but most of the starting values that for your start research would be generated randomly by the computer. And the advantage here is that you're not limiting yourself by your own experience. For every one of those, so for example, we talked about three parameters, you'd basically generate 50 sets of three parameters. Some of those might be based on intuition or approximate models, and some of them will be generated by the computer. You calculate the cost function associated with each one of those values. You sort those cost functions into the best cases, the middle cases, and the worst cases, according to the values of the cost function. And then what you do is you kill or you throw away the worst cost functions. You throw away the sets of parameters associated with the worst cost function, and you generate replacements for those worst ones that you've thrown away, and you generate them from the best, yeah? The part of the population that you've termed the best. So you have this idea of the, the best ones survive and they procreate, they generate new ones. And then the question is, how do they go about generating new ones? Well, so for example, you have some parameter values, Okay, and you can write down those parameter values. So for example, a period or a coefficient, you can write it down as, for example, a binary representation. And then you can do ways to swatch, switch pieces of the binary representation between different parameter values. Okay, so if I've got a set, yeah, and I've got th three parameters, and one of them is period, I can take the period from one of the best populations, I've got a period, I've got, uh, I've got two, let's say, two periods, and I write both of those periods out as binary numbers, and then I can switch over, I can switch values inside the binary representation, or I can come along and I can actually take chunks of the binary representation from one and slot it into a parts of the other. So I change, this is how I generate new periods, okay? The other thing is I can cause mutation, I can randomly change values in the binary. And of course, we go from the most significant to the least significant, but I've got a finite probability that I can vary even the most significant value. And what this leads to is, it leads to these new sets of parameters for which I will again calculate cost functions. And I will again rank all these cost functions. And I will again throw away the worst ones. And then I will go forward and I will, again, from the best ones, I will generate out a new set of population. Now, again, what this is going to produce is going to produce a family of solutions. And hopefully over time, and again, you can apply this technique, you will find sets of local minima. And again, you can go away and compare the performance of the different sets of local minima. Yeah. So that's how this idea works. And again, there's a little 
diagram here showing the random generation evaluation of the individuals. If you have metric criteria and you can stop, you've got best, or you've got the selection crossover mutation and back again. Yeah. And again, you can compare to find out whether you converge or not. You can compare the population, the values in the population, or you can compare the actual cost functions. You can rank the cost functions. And simulation evolution is very similar. Uh, what I know here is that this is numerically intensive, okay? But it avoids getting trapped in local minima and it avoids any bias that's built into the choice of the starting point. The machine is pretty much doing it all. But as I said, this can be slow and numerically intensive. And this is where, for example, making sure you use the least number of parameters and constraining those parameters, the search range, uh, using anything you can use, all of these things will make the space, the, the parameter space smaller, the dimensions, and the ranges and step sizes smaller, and therefore will limit the area you search in by practical means. Search algorithm, simulation evolution is quite similar to genetic algorithm, but basically you random choose the sets of parameters, you calculate the cost functions, you eliminate or kill a certain worst percentage, you've got a kill rate, you generate an entirely new smaller population, yeah, again, using the random process, using all the remaining fittest as progenitors, so you'd add random noise basically to the values you've got from the best cases, you generate the new population with some size. And usually what you do is you reduce the population. So you might start off at 100. And then every step you throw away two or three or four or five. And then you basically go and you rank them again. Progeny are created by adding random noise to the previous generation creating parameters. And given a, pre a parameter x, the offspring is x plus this random noise. And this random noise can be generated using Gaussian noise. And you could have, for example, as you step forward, you could change the statistical properties of just Gaussian noise. You could make it have a narrower, narrower distribution, for example, or a broader one. And the standard deviation can be used by the user to generate in the computer. You can have different distributions associated with different parameters. Now, this type of process, again, is numerically intensive and you know, if you ask me which is the better, I'd say they're pretty much a, much of a muchness, but I wouldn't be a, an expert on this, okay? I just use the things. But to note here is that there's a huge family of these. And I just gave this, this is something I got on the web. It talks about optimization. This is, you know, part of this search algorithm, a part of optimization techniques and inverse scatter techniques in electromagnetic theory. And there's a huge number of techniques and methodologies. And these are just the ones that are, these are primarily to do with statistical methods. Yeah, if you look here, you've got calculus based, which will be the gradient method. Yeah, you've got uh, search techniques, dynamical program, random searches, okay? You come down to evolutionary algorithms, which include the genetic algorithm and evolutionary strategies. Yeah, and all the way down, even to mixtures of differential and statistical differential methods. So there's huge amounts of work being done on this because finding, doing these searches in an efficient way, in a general way, in a robust way, and also in a numerically efficient way are a very big topic. So it's really worthwhile all engineers knowing about this type of thing, even just big familiarity. Uh, again, we talked about using different math models. And so I'm going to talk now about the practical situation using different models. And we talked about amplitude, Koganlik, and rigorous. And I said for the EMAG, we're certainly going to start with Koganlik and then as necessary, go to the rigorous. If you use surface relief gratings in the resonance domain, you're going to have to use rigorous. If you use the surface relief gratings that have very big periods and are shallow, we can use our transmittance function. Okay. And there's lots of work done by all using these different methods to design different components. And this is an example where you can use this transition model. So you assume that you've got a diffraction grating of some structure. So here, for example, the positions of each one of these steps or the widths of each one of these steps could be part of our search parameter. But for example, here is a binary that each one of them has an amplitude, which is pi. This is our phase shift through the individual parts. So we could imagine this laminar structure having this sort of a, a phase steps. And then the location of each of these phase steps along a pattern here would be actually what we'd optimize. We'd try and find a pattern where we'd have a, a minimum separation and maximum separation, a fabrication process, which is limited. But we can use a transmission model if we assume that the actual widths here and the widths of the smallest uh, gap and the widths of the smallest step are all big compared to the wavelength. And the depth here is basically not going to give us a phase shift more than pi. So if you've got glass here, 1.5, for example, a refractive index, that means here we've got a height here, which is lambda over three. Okay. And what you can do is you can free up 
So here we've got a situation where we require everything to be binary and symmetric. And we can use a transmittance theory because we know that, for example, the periods here, the structure sizes are all bigger than the 10 times the wavelength and the phase is less than pi or two pi. So the depth is less than a wavelength. So we've got this sort of gross type structure so we can use transmittance theory. We can show that doing optimization procedure, the best diffraction efficiency we can get with something like this, which is binary and symmetric with a phase shift of pi is 72%. Now, this is with the scalar theory. There's no resonance effects. This is non-selective. The polarization has no effect. And then going down and assuming binary, but with a pi phase shift, but non-symmetric, okay? So you can see the pattern here isn't the same as the pattern here. We can get to 80%. We've got an extra degree of freedom. We can search in a bigger space. If we have binary arbitrary depth, yeah? We can, and non-symmetric, then again, we can come along. So we can vary this and we can get a higher efficiency. And if we go to something which is multi-level, yeah, and we have the phase here of varying up and down zero to pi, non-symmetric, we can get to 90%, okay? So we can get quite high efficiencies for surface relief gratings if we have a transmission model with these degrees of freedom. The only constraint here in terms of fabrication is we've got lamellar, all lamellar regions. This would be doable with a single mask. Here, we'd have to use multiple masks. So the manufacturing process becomes more and more complicated. We have more degrees of freedom and therefore we can achieve higher diffraction efficiency. And we would do that using this design type process. If we go to the resonance regime, however, we've got to use rigors, okay? Now, iterative phase retrieval is also part of this. So we've talked about inverse scatter, okay? But we may also have a situation where we're measuring intensities and we want to find out phases, okay? Here's an example where we've got a big structure, a two-dimensional structure. Here's the structure here, and we've got a lens here. So effectively what we've got over here is a Fourier transform. We've got a set of dots. So we want to generate an array of dots. We put a plane wave into the structure. We want to generate an array of dots, and they're relatively well se separated, but they're symmetric, yeah? And here's a cross-section, a measured cross-section of the results. Here we've got a line of these intense spots, and here's the two-dimensional array. So we've achieved using our design process. In this case, we would use a transmittance theory because the sizes of these, this here is the actual pattern that was used here. And for example, we can have absorption gradings where we use a lot of, so we could have a checkerboard black and white. And we see there is a fundamental unit here. If we look at this, there's this type of thing, periodic, re repeated, if you want. You can see there's a period down here. So you see there's a structure, there's a finite structure, which is repeated. So it's periodic. Uh, the point here is that, this is a, can be made using uh, amplitude structures or phase structures, and we will get this type of pattern, but with the amplitude structures, we're gonna be throwing away a lot of the light, a lot of the light will be absorbed. Uh, but in this type of case, we can do this using an iterative algorithm, okay? Which is different from the search algorithms we had before. We basically say, well, suppose this is a phase object, okay? Suppose this is a phase object. If it's made of glass, then we put in something which is a unit amplitude, and we know that immediately after this, we're going to have a unit amplitude everywhere, but we have a phase modulation, okay? So the light will go through the phase object and we'll get no variation in the intensity immediately after the grating because it's transmittance theory. And this is just a phase variation. So if we take the magnitude squared of the field immediately after the structure, it's going to have an intensity which is equal to the intensity variation of the input beam. And if the input beam is uniform, that means we'll have an amplitude which is one everywhere. And then over here, what we have is if we think of this as a Fourier transform, over here, we can measure the intensities. And what we will actually have is we will have the power spectral density of that field. So the phase variation over here, yeah? If we take the Fourier transform of that, we get an intensity variation over here. Now, the field here only has a variation in the phase. The field in this output plane will have a variation in the phase and the intensity. But once we put a camera in there or a detector, we're only going to measure the intensity. So we know the input amplitude, but we do not know the input phase. And if we knew the input phase, we could actually make that surface relief structure. We know the output intensity, but we don't know the phase. If we knew the intensity and the phase, we could do an inverse Fourier transform and we would know exactly what the phase has to be. What we do know though, is that whatever the phase is over here, if we do an inverse Fourier transform, we have to get something which has got a uniform amplitude. We have to, okay? because that's the physical situation. And so we use this to our advantage. What we say is that we apply an iterative technique 
where we know that the amplitude here is one, but we don't know the phase. We know the amplitude here are these spikes, but we don't know the phase. But we know that these two planes, the fields, the complex valued fields in the two planes are related by the Fourier transform. So what we do is we start off with a unit amplitude here, okay? And possibly we apply a random phase. And then we do a Fourier transform of that and we get something at the output, which is wrong. And then what we do is we keep the phase that we predicted using this random phase here, but we change the amplitude to the desired amplitude. And then we do an inverse Fourier transform. And when we do that inverse Fourier transform, we're now going to get something which is not uniform in intensity, but and also has a phase variation. So we know it has to be unit, uh, uniform in intensity. So we keep the phases that we calculated, but we change all the values to the same intensity. And we keep going back and forth. This is why it's called ping pong. We keep going back and forth until we have something over here which has unit amplitude here and a particular phase, which allows us to calculate the structure. And we have something over here which has the correct intensity distribution. And that's called this gershberg saxton ping pong algorithm. And if this is a big period object, the model we can use to generate this is basically going to be this, uh, to actually predict what the structure is going to be, will be this transmittance type theory. We're basically going to say that phase is produced by that object, by a transmittance theory. There are a huge number of these algorithms in hybrid input output and error reduction. And they're used, for example, also with digital holography, where we measure some intensity over here, and we use that and maybe some other constraints, the extent of the image or some other a priori knowledge to be able to propagate back and find out what our object looks like. If we have propagation and free space, and if we know the amplitude and phase at any plane, we can then propagate using the Fresnel transform, we can propagate backwards and reconstitute the, inst the intensity at any plane, okay? Okay, uh, refractive lens is the Fresnel zone plate. So here we have the refractive lens, here we have done modulo, for example, two pi or modulo pi, and we end up with this Fresnel zone type arrangement. And then we can imagine manufacturing any one of these subsections using either a prism type uh, sawtooth arrangement. And here we've got a lamellar structure where we vary the fill factor. And so we get this phase variation. Here we saw an element that was made the cylindrical lens and basically the power light could be put through the cylindrical lens, yeah and we could burn a hole. This shows the Gaussian shape of the input beam, and this shows the cylindrical line produced by the cylindrical lens. So you can actually see what's actually, you can manufacture the things and you can actually see them in operation. This will be a corresponding two-dimensional pattern, again, using this idea of this fill factor. You can see this gradual fill factor here, and this will be a two-dimensional op operation of that. This will be a lens that will give you a focal point. This is another example of a fabrication procedure. And this is just giving one of the types, you can have a substrate, you go multiple coating, you basically do some exposure. This could be optical exposure or reactive uh, um, e-beam exposure. And then you do some etching. And depending on the type of etching, this will be a wet etch. You can produce a pattern which looks like these V grooves. And this is just an electron microscopy image of one of these V grooves. And then you can use these things and you can design them. So in other words, you can choose, for example, the depth that you etch to, yeah, in order to design the operation. In this case, you'd have to do this linear decomposition, lamellar decomposition. You'd have to treat each slice as a rectangular grating and then stack them up on top of one another. And again, just to remind you about this conical diffraction. Again, I just want to remind you, you can be in this plane. And we usually talk about being in this plane where this beam here is coming down the Y axis here. So Y now it corresponds to our thickness. And if this beam comes down here and we've got a reflection element, all of our diffraction orders are gonna be like this. So here's our blue line input. We're in the plane. We come up here to the circle and we come down here to this circle. This is all symmetric. All of these lie in the same plane. They're in this X zero Y plane. The light is coming in down this direction and we've got a diffraction orders coming right back up again on this circle here. If we move out of this plane into this Z zero Y plane, we're in conical diffraction, okay? In which case we're gonna have a beam coming in here at an angle. So we get this transmitted beam and then we're gonna get beams which are coming over here off this side. 
and coming in here, we've got this circle here, they're coming to this point and to this point. And so now these points are coming out at angles. Yeah, they're no longer on this nice uh, line on the wall, they're going to be on some curved surface. And we mentioned this because we can use this to basically talk about oper operation or application of these devices. So we take that V-group device and we push on a beam coming down in the Y direction. This is the plane of the grating. And if we've got T polarization, so our E field is pointing parallel to the actual periods, we can get 50% of the light diffracted here and here. Okay, so we get 50 of the light percent here and here. This is 48.8 and 48.8. And this depth here now is a fraction of the wavelength. This is not a volume grating. Yeah, it's not a hologram. It's a surface relief structure. And what happens if we now rotate this around Y? Well, if we start off with TE and we rotate by 90 degrees, we're now going to have the E field pointing in this direction. Okay, and we can measure the diffraction efficiency in the plus and minus first order. And they're going to be equal because we've always got this negative. So we start off over here with them 50-50, both of them containing 50% of the energy. This experiment, this is theory. And we can reach a point over here where essentially there's very, very little light in the diffraction orders. So by rotating this surface relief grating, we can go from a 50-50 beam splitter to an actual mirror, which 98% of the light is being reflected. We can also start in the grating plane, yeah? So we can come back here in this plane here and we can change the angle. Instead of having it come down on Y, we can vary it back and forth in this plane. And if we do that, we get this characteristics. Again, the plus and minus orders now don't have the same diffraction efficiency. And we can see here that the minus diffraction order disappears. Remember I told you before about extinction, it no longer propagates, but we see that our plus first order here and our zeroth order here can come to a point here where they're equal to one another, yeah? If we go to conical diffraction, we start off with the TE polarization here. Yeah, this is our TE polarization. And now we move in this direction. So we start off with TE polarization and we move in this direction. And if we do that, we see our plus and minus orders are equal. And we reach a point over here where we have three beams with equal diffraction efficiency. Yeah. If we start off our conical with TM polarization, yeah, and we do what we did up here, we move in this direction we can actually produce something where we get again a three-way split, but we now have the TM starting point. So from this relatively simple, and this is relatively simple to produce, yeah? Because this is a standard process associated with these materials. You can produce a lot of different functionality, okay? You can get a lot of different operations out of these devices. If we go to the next one again, this here now is the one-dimensional one anisotropic, yeah, so you have this in parallel. This would be two di dimensional isotropic. So independent of where the E field points, it's going to see the same refractive index here. So this would be like a, a prism in this direction, which this, because it's one dimensional, it would be sensitive to polarization. This would be a prism which is not sensitive to polarization, or certainly the sensitivity to polarization is greatly reduced. And again, we can look at our conical and our normal mount. Here is where we're incident in the grating plane. And we see here, we've got a very strong first order diffraction. So this is a, this here is a the one dimensional grating. So we've got a very strong prism like effect, deflecting effect. And you can see that it's fairly stable here from zero to 10 degrees. It's relatively flat. And again, this is theory versus experiment. We can look at what happens for the TM case when we change the angle of incidence. And this, what's happened here is that all of the higher orders, okay, so we've got this, grating structure. And we can imagine that each one of these is inside a fundamental period, okay? And then we put the whole thing together and we've got a big period, but we can see there's like a fundamental period. And then we repeat that over this with this variation. So we end up with a gross period. So we would expect to see above this structure diffraction orders associated with that fine period, which means a lot of diffraction orders. But what we see here is that we get a very strong first order and what we see, especially in this region, is that all of the higher order diffractions are very, very small compared to the first order. This is a, a order of magnitude smaller. We can start with TE conical. And again, we can see here, we reach a point where we've got it evenly split between our plus and zero. And we can rotate around the Z axis. And again, we can get this 50-50 beam splitter. So again, this is a situation here where we've got a normal instance and we're rotating about the normal instance and we can get this characteristic. So again, a lot of different types of functionality. Um, and just a quick one here, applying those things, again, a nice starting one for surface reef grating is this is lamellar. It's got a very simple period. It's got a particular refractive index. We've got an, a beam, a TE beam incident at a particular angle. 
okay? And we say that, for example, we can change our period, we can change our width here, we can change the height, and we can apply these algorithms to search for the best. So this is a single objective, maximum diffraction efficiency, and if we fix that angle, we're also going to fix the period. So then what we're talking about is varying the fill factor and varying the height, two parameters. And the question is, what's the highest diffraction efficiency we can get? That's one problem. But we can have a multi-objective cost function where we say, okay, now we've got a beam incident, which is a mixture of TE and TM. And for the exact same structure, we want to find the one that provides the most power yeah, in the same angle. And we'd have a different problem to solve. We'd get a different answer between this case and this case. Okay, but this case would, of course, work for both TE and TM. Now, what's interesting is that if we take the ideas we've got from, for example, what we've been discussing about Bragg's, Bragg's theory, and we come along and say, well, of course, we want to be playing this grating. It's got lots of components, but we want to play it on Bragg. And if you use that as a starting point, the best solution actually has this replaying this off Bragg. And the reason is because in this case, we're going to have very strong boundary conditions, for, for example. And just saying it should work best on Bragg doesn't it take into account the reflection coefficients of the boundary. It certainly doesn't take into account the fact that the TE and TM have different reflection coefficients here. So you end up with a solution which is, doesn't obey any single physical rules. It obeys all of these rules together in some way. The other thing to note here is that if we can have a cost function where we give equal weight to TE and TM, okay? So we try and find the solution, assuming that we have the same amount of input power in TE and TM, and we are equally interested in producing the maximum efficiency, combined efficiency of TE and TM here. But of course, we may be more interested in having the TE come down here. And we may be more interested in having the TM come up here. So again, we can do a search where we try to maximize the amount of diffraction efficiency in TE in this direction and maximum amount, the amount of power in TM in this direction and to form a surface relief binary uh, resonant um, grating that does polarizing beam splitters. Okay. Now it's, um, we're at a quarter two. Um, we haven't, uh, you know, uh, no, I've, I just, this is more general. I'm not going to talk about this, but I went and talked, I gave you some he slides here about the, the Gersberg Saxon method because I think people might be interested in that. And I gave some flow charts and the actual algorithm associated with it. And I talked a little bit about when it stagnates. And I also talked a bit about the error reduction hybrid input output and some work we've done on mixing these things together. Where, for example, you do a search where you ping pong algorithm, where you use mixtures of these. You don't only use the Gersberg Saxon, but you have error reduction and hybrid input or Gersberg Saxon and hybrid input output and uh, a cost function. And for example, the convergence of these methods. I don't want to talk, this is not really related to the logography, but just to say to you, there's a lot of different tools that you can out there. And then another one is that we've talked about constraining the amplitude and the, in the, in, uh, the intensity in the input domain and the output domain, but you can also constrain the boundaries. So you can say, well, I know my input has a certain extent and therefore any solution I come up with, I don't really care what happens outside the extent. I want to get the thing to work within whatever extent I have for my input and whatever extent I have for my output. So those are extra constraints and you can have quite complex boundary constraints and still produce quite good results. And I give these things here. So again, if people are interested about that, I can talk to you about that. Okay, are there any questions about this? I, I think this is very a very good general interest, uh, both the surface relief with the volume. And I think this discussion of automatic uh, search routines is, is quite general and is also useful for the holography, but it's also useful for a range of other problems you meet in engineering. Okay, are there any questions? I think that there is a question from Vasily. Please. Uh, yeah, um, so it is something related to the mostly to the beginning of today's lecture. So okay. you've shown a lot of graphs of the dependencies of diffraction efficiency on time or exposition for yeah. uh, stained polymer materials, right? Yeah, so this type of graph. Indeed, yeah. yeah. Uh, are there any studies, and if I mean systematic and global, yeah, of, of the maximum diffraction efficiency or modulation dependency on dye concentration? So yes. not on exposition, but on concentration. Yeah. So for example, I can give you some references. I don't know if I included the reference up here. Um, uh, so the, we have models and we've also done experiments. Now, here's the thing. You, you can't do all the experiments with all the dyes. 
So I know groups. There's a group in Mulhouse. I don't know if you know the group in Mulhouse. And the group in Mulhouse basically develops new dyes uh, for photochemical reactions. And so they literally have hundreds of dyes. And they have a whole series of um, a whole series of work they do. Sorry, I'm just coming up here to see if I can find the. Uh, oh, sorry, it's a, it's in the next talk. Excuse me. Uh, sorry, this is the next talk, but I'm, I'll, I'll show you this the next day. Um, so I've given a, a series of papers here, and I'm just looking to see if I've got a paper here. Uh, spatial frequency response of photopolymer materials containing four different photosy photosynthesizers. Okay. And we've applied our models to characterize photosynthesis, so both in acrylamide and other materials. And of course, the concentration of the dye uh, increases the sensitivity of the material. Okay, that's the general rule. So the more dye you have in there, the stronger the absorption and the, and the greater the rate of generation of dye radicals, of, of, of radicals which would lead to polymerization. Yeah. Uh, but of course, different dyes work at different wavelengths. Yeah, they have different wavelength sensitivities. And in general, it's well known that red dyes are the least sensitive, okay, because the photons from in the red are the, have the least energy, okay? So there's a whole range of characteristics associated with different dyes and different dye concentrations. And there's a whole lot of ways that people characterize these dyes. Now, one of the things I worked hard to do is to try and characterize dyes in the material, okay? I'm not sure if there's much point in characterizing a dye in a liquid solution. You can certainly find certain parameter values, but once you put the dye into the polymer material, it, the characteristics can change. They potentially can change because of interactions between the dye and the other substances in the material. And so one of the things we've done a lot of work on, and I'm gonna talk about, if I can just show you a little diagram down here, is where we, uh, well, if one thing is, for example, in our exposure, we measure the transmitted beams, Okay, so that will give us a measure of how much light is absorbed in the layer during the exposure. And then we have a replay with a beam which shouldn't be expected by the dye at all, okay? Uh, but if I can just find the, the, the figure I want to show, uh, this, this type of experiment. So what we do is we prepare layers. And what we've done is we've prepared layers without monomer and with monomer, and we've uh, done layers where we have polymerized the material or we've done some polymerization. So we can have different concentrations of various chemicals, but one of the things we do is we put in the dye and we can change the concentration of the dye. Now, we then expose that with a single beam, okay? So we, and we, we, we're not trying to record any gratings, we're just exposing with a different beam or maybe with a different wavelength. And what we do is we measure the amount of light that's transmitted. So that's the first thing. How we measure it as a function of time, yeah? Then the other thing we do is we expose the layer for a certain amount of time. And then we stop the exposure and we watch the recovery of the dye, okay? And what happens is that every time you expose, yeah, the dye will recover and a lot of the dye will recover back to its ground state, but a certain amount of the dye will be bleached. It will be permanently altered and will no longer be available during the exposure. So I don't know if I've got a diagram here. This is a fairly basic type of diagram where you have a, a dye in the ground state absorbs a photon, becomes a dye radical of first order. This is usually very short lived. And again, we have different models for different dyes. A lot of the dyes we've dealt with, and I'll mention these explicitly, have this characteristic and that paper talks about them. But there are other types of dyes we've looked at. This, this radical can emit a photon and go back to the ground state, or it can be an electron donor in some way to some other process and can go down to the ground state. So they're recovered. They go back into the dye ground state and are available to absorb again. But some of them uh, involving what's called inter-system crossing can become the radical of the dye, which leads to polymerization, okay? Now, some of those dyes are going to react and become a bleached form of dye, yeah? Some of them are actually going to re react here with this state here uh, or, or other chemicals and are basically going to produce what's called a dihydro dye, which is also a bleached form of the dye. And some of them here are going to simply emit a photon or emit some energy and they're going to come back into the ground state or they're going to react with maybe ra oxygen radicals to produce, uh, um, uh, in, uh, to be inhibited. So, so they're going to be driven back to the ground state by an alternative route. And these routes have different probabilities and different likelihoods are taking place. But some of it is going to react so as to produce the radical, which is going to produce the monomer, the radicalized monomer, which is going to produce the polymer chain. 
And all of these reactions have some rate. They have some rate associated with them. So depending on the rates associated with these different processes, yeah, you can find out what actually happens dynamically. And therefore you can find out what happens in relation to the concentration, the initial concentration of dye, because you end up with coupled constant, coupled equations depending on the concentration of the dye. Now, I might be going further than this, but we've done very, very careful sets of experiments on a number of dyes. And we've also talked to the people in Malus who've done other types of experiments. And generally, these people are quite surprised at how such a simple system can be used to find out all the rates associated with a lot of these different operations, okay? And again, in the actual polymer layer itself. So not in some external solution. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, Th thank you very much. And I, I wanted also to, to uh, tell you that I absolutely agree with the viewpoint that uh, in solution and in polymer, dye behaves, uh, may behave absolutely different. Yeah, I mean, one of the things to understand is that the dyes are very, very big things. Mm -hmm. They're massive compared to the monomer in general. Okay, now some materials like PQ, PMMA, the actual material itself that actually forms the attachments, you don't really have chain formation in PMMA, but basically the PQ is, is both the dye and is, if you'd like, the thing that reacts and attaches to the matrix. So these are very different types of materials. But what I'm striving for is, first of all, a language that the chemist can understand and the engineer can understand and you can use when dealing with laboratory situations. So in, in other words, an engineering thing, yeah? I know people who do, brilliant people. I don't know if you know Professor Yasua Tomita who works in Japan and he's a really clever fella. Now, don't tell him I said he's really clever, okay? Because I always tell him he's terrible, okay? But he works on statistical thermodynamics and we've had some very long discussions in, in the bub, in bars where we've discussed our approaches. And he said to me that he can't believe that what I do works, but it works and it's very easy and it's very useful. It's not necessarily giving you the fundamental parameter, parametric values, but you can use it in real world situations. And one of the things I mentioned before is the idea of being able to compare materials that are very, very different. So how do you compare something like an epoxy resin or PQ PMA with the covestro material or acrylamide material? Because covestro and acrylamide are more or less free radical, whereas PQ, PMA and uh, epoxies aren't. Yeah, they're maybe crop materials. And what I would say to you as well, the engineer is not interested specifically in the actual processes that take place, but he's interested in parameterizing the problem. So identifying a series of parameters which can be used to identify the characteristics which are important for the application, okay? So in other words, things like the sensitivity, yeah? You shine light into any of these materials, you don't care, the material's like a black box, you measure some things and it gives you information. For example, things you can put into certain rate equations. And then you can use these equations to make predictions and they're reasonable predictions as long as your equations are, are sensible. Or you want to know what's the finest period you can record in a material. And there may be many things which vary the spatial frequency, but if I can lump all of those different effects into one or two parameters in a set of coupled equations, I can with some certainty go away and make predictions about how this material will behave compared to another material. Yeah. And I'm very interested in that. And basically because, you know, it's, it's, materials are horrible. <laughs> okay. I like, I love Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations is beautiful. Materials are horrible. The problem is that materials are where it's at. If you don't have the material, you can't make the thing. And if you can't make the thing as an engineer, I'm not awfully interested in it in a lot of ways. Yeah. I really like to see things made. You know, I like measurements. You can have really wonderful theories, but nothing destroys a beautiful theory, like a hard, cold fact. Okay. All you need is one measurement that proves the theory is wrong and then the theory is wrong, full stop, yeah? Sorry, are there any other questions now? As I said, I'm gonna try and go through this slowly and carefully, all this stuff with the dye and the materials and I'm trying to only go to present material results that I'm fairly certain about. So none, not, not too many wild and wonderful speculations but just to give people a feeling for what goes on and what the problems are. And if I can stick some things like search algorithms in there, which are useful and necessary, but that are good for engineers to know, then I'll do that as well, you know, because I think it's good for the education. Uh, Professor Sheridan, actually, yeah. I have a question, but this sure. question is also regarding the dye and the dye processes. Sure. If you won't mind. Uh, 
firstly, am I right that the dye concentration affects not only uh, the speed of the polymerization uh, and the speed of reaction, but also it affects the uh, average length of the polymer chain? Um, okay, I, I don't have evidence of that. Okay, I wouldn't okay. have evidence of that directly. Okay, mm -hmm. so for example, uh, one thing is that the dye molecules are very big. Okay, so we could imagine a situation where we would have bleached all of the dye molecules in an area which is strongly in, uh, exposed, and we haven't exposed it, we haven't bleached it in the dark region. And we might expect the dye to diffuse from the dark region into the bright region, but because they're such big molecules, they can't move very easily. Okay, so that's one case in which the, the, the mobility of the dye can strongly affect what's going on. Okay, now of course the radicals generated by the dye uh, may, may travel more quickly. Yeah, uh, but if we have saturated, if we've used up all the dye in a region, then effectively we're not going to get any polymerization in that region which means that we're probably going to get polymerization at the edges of that region, which gives you another process by which you're going to end up with a distorted uh, grating with higher harmonics. Okay, now to address your problem, if we have the generation of a lot of radicals, if we have initiation of a lot of monomer, yeah, because of the concentration of dye, one thing we're gonna get, for example, is we've got different ways of termination of the chains. I'm gonna talk about this. So now we're, 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 we're going ahead, but it's probably not a harm for people just to see these things. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, okay, sorry, I, I, I have an arrangement here, but it's, uh, it's a particular type of arrangement, okay? Um, sorry, that's not this now. Uh, I want to talk about... Uh, we have different ways to terminate chains, okay? So we can terminate, uh, we can have two long chains, yeah, so we grow them and they're long and they terminate one another. So they basically are growing, they have an active tip and they can terminate one another. And therefore we end up with a chain which is basically N plus M monomers long. And we can also have a termination where basically the two long chains terminate one another and produce two chains, one which is N long and one which is M long. There's different mechanisms and there's different ways to model mechanisms. Another way you can have a termination is if you have a growing chain and it's terminated by a radical, okay? And then we end up with a dead, term, a dead polymer, it's not growing anymore. Now, if you've got a lot of dye, yeah, if you have a lot of dye, you're gonna have a lot of growing chains and you're gonna have a lot of active radicals in the material. And therefore, if there's a lot of these, if there's a high density of these things and they're located close to one another, the mechanism of termination, different mechanisms will dominate. Okay, and the actual average length of chains before they terminate one another will change. Okay, do you follow what I'm saying? Yep, yep, totally. So therefore, yeah, the concentration of dye, yeah, will affect the average length of the chains. But of course, it will depend also on how you expose. If you expose mm -hmm. very, very weakly, yeah, then you may have quite a number of um, chains, but the, the number of initiations depends not only on the concentration of dye, it's also gonna depend on the concentration of monomer and it's gonna depend on the intensity of the exposing light. Yeah. So you see always there's, it's all, so when you ask me the question, I have to say many things before I can answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and even the answer I've given you there now, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, hmm, maybe I should mention this or maybe I should mention that, you know, because there are other processes taking place. So I'm hoping yeah. that I can start off with a simple, this a simpler type of model. So this will be classed as a simpler type of model and then I'll build up, uh, especially how I express this, how this happens in terms of the modeling. Yeah, it depends, yeah. But dye is a huge thing. And this is part of the problem. I mean, I can honestly tell you that I've had, uh, if I deal with a chemist, they want to have a chemical, they want chemical formulas. So they want to see this, yeah? They want to see this type of formula, yeah? And for me, this for type of formula, this is not an equation. This is like hieroglyphics. It's like a picture, yeah? So, but then I try to improve this by putting in things like rates to help me understand my differential equations, yeah? but they want this type of diagram. As an engineer, I really want to see a diagram which looks like this, a flow chart, okay? 
So some of the chemists have things like this, but a lot of them don't. And there are different, different styles of flowchart, yeah, that people use that sort of emphasize different types of effects. For me, ultimately, what I want to do is I want to go from the flowchart and I want to go from the chemical equation, yeah, this type of thing. I want to go to differential equations, yeah. So I would have started off with differential equations and then I would have had to teach myself this chemical formulas and I would have had to teach myself or develop these flow charts in order to understand what was going on because I just didn't understand what was happening. So I still don't really know, I certainly don't know everything that's happening but I probably have a better picture now when I can read papers written by the chemists and the chemists can read papers that I write, sort of. But they still don't believe what I say. So I can predict things and mostly the things are correct. And sometimes they have very, very complicated computer models and they will run their computer models and they will come back to me and say, well, we get things which are the same size and the same output that you do, but we don't know how you do what you do. And basically because I do it empirically. All the, the, the proof of the pudding, the reason I use a particular rate is because using that rate, I can achieve a good fit to my result, okay? I don't derive uh, things from some first principles. Yeah. Yep. But as I go forward, they get more and more complicated. So I get closer and closer to the first principles, I think. Yeah. So it's uh, just I mentioned here in this diagram that you that you show that uh, here you have actually two rates or two coefficients. Yep. It's AR and KB, like uh, rate of bleaching and rate of uh, recovery. Yep that yeah, you are well, coming we've got, out. We've, yeah, we've got, we've got two very different mechanisms of bleaching, which I'll talk about, yeah? But mm -hmm. basically you can lump those together. You can separate them out or you can lump them together. And I try to make models where I can lump as much together as I can, but we mm -hmm. can actually go out and identify. We've experimental results where we've shown the different types of bleaching and we found rates for the two different types of bleaching. Oh, okay. So I will start off with the simplest models. You know, because again, if you look at the lit papers we wrote, the very first papers we wrote had nothing about any of this, okay? In fact, the first papers we wrote, if I can find an example, and if you go and look at Zhao's paper, essentially what was assumed was, excuse me, I just come down here. It was very simple that basically you had an intensity profile and you had a rate of polymerization, which were proportional to that, okay? Yep. And then, then there were other models were saying, well, the rate of polymerization is not proportional to the intensity, it's, it's proportional to the intensity raised to some power. Yeah, so you had a nonlinear effect, okay? And you only had, it was completely local. So the polymerization at a particular point was directly related to, to the conversion of monomer to polymer was directly related to the light at that point. Yeah, which means that when you switch the light off, everything stops. Yep. So, and this is where I would have started. I would have started off with Zhao, okay, and Morales. And then I would have gone on and said, well, this, this does not make sense to me, in particular because this type of model tells you nothing about spatial frequency, high, fre high spatial frequency cutoff. Yeah, it would explain low spatial frequency cutoff, but not high spatial frequency cutoff. Yep. So you're caught, yeah. And so that, that seemed to me quite an important aspect of the model, that the model has to be able to predict the most important thing. And the most important thing is what is the smallest, the highest resolution I can achieve? What's the smallest thing I can record? And that model didn't tell me anything about that. Okay. Yep. Okay. I think that's, yeah. yeah. So I'll, the next day I'm gonna start off talking about this stuff uh, tomorrow. Yeah, we're, we're, I have a lecture tomorrow, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think so, yep. Okay. I will just I'm check. Gonna, I'm gonna talk about this stuff tomorrow, yeah? And again, the, as I said here, this is much less developed than the, the work with the EMAG. The EMAG stuff is very well, you know, the literature is solid and sound, yeah? But the modeling of the materials is much less solid and sound. So again, I'm gonna try and present the, the background stuff and I'll try and bring it up to, as I said, if I can, if I can, especially because as I said, I'm talking now to master students. So I'm gonna try and say, well, we come up to 2010 and that stuff is pretty reasonably okay. Here's more advanced stuff, but you've got to take it over with a pinch of salt. Okay. Hello. Okay. Yep, 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 we are here. 
Are you hearing this? Send you, I send you the slide there for number eight. Or if I, I think I might already have done that. So that'd be okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. And again, if so you, I think we, we don't we don't have any more questions. No. Or from the students. Yeah. No, no questions. I thought I saw something in chat, but maybe it's an old one. Oh yeah, okay, this is from you, yeah. Okay, yeah. so again, just uh, if the YouTube can be sent around, that would be good because as I said, it's probably good for them to try and soak in this stuff a little bit. And um, I hope I haven't gone too far off the reservation now with the surface relief gratings and the optimization, but I, I, it, is, it is applicable to the processing of the data. And I think it's something good for them to know if they haven't met it elsewhere. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I also find it very useful. Okay. Okay, folks. So listen, I'll see you tomorrow, yeah? Yep. Thank you. And again, I, I just, just to mention to you, I mentioned to Vladimir, some of the slides have got typing errors on them. Um, I, I think it's because I've transferred from older versions of, of PowerPoint and also I've changed computer. So some of my slides, uh, if it hasn't got the right fonts or something, they, it seems to freeze up or lock. But I'll try and correct everything as I go forward. Yeah? And if anybody has questions, please send me an email. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank Maybe you. Vlad, Vladimir, can I talk to you just for a second after the students leave? Yep. Of leave? course. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Or whoever it's the staff, you know, just if the students go, then I can just talk briefly to the staff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know uh, who's yeah. here and who's not here. Um, so, uh, okay, so the, the thing basically is, um, is it going okay from your end, Vladimir? Because I said I have no feedback here. People are saying very nice things, um, but I, I wonder...